if it starts raining for these TV shows. Actually, that's how it falls tonight. And then tomorrow morning. Then we start doing the rehearsals tomorrow afternoon, right? Yeah. Tomorrow afternoon, Friday afternoon, Saturday morning. Yep. So, it must fall now. Just by six. Good afternoon everybody and welcome to our show before the show. I'm on vehicle, my name is Tristan and Sebastian is on camera with me this afternoon. Say hello Sebastian. Hello. So Sebastian and I have had a run of good luck the last time we were together so we're hoping that this afternoon we shall have a similar situation. The last time we were on a vehicle, what did we see Sebastian? We two saw... Cheetahs, two leopards. Ah, two cheetahs, two leopards. Shall we repeat that this afternoon? Yeah. I think that's a good idea. Maybe let's add a tiger in there. A tiger as well. Yeah. We'll have to go to the tent and visit James for the tiger. <laughs> or we'll go to the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. No, I'm joking there. Camp where Taylor is... Taylor the tiger is man down. So we'll maybe go and see how she's doing. But otherwise, I think two cheetah, two leopard would be a fair afternoon. I'd be quite happy with that. I know Jamie's going to go try to see if she can't find Husana, where we left him this morning. I know she did find him on foot, so she'll probably have a better idea of where exactly he is. And I am going to probably head towards the east, since we are going to look for cheetah. Maybe we'll go towards cheetah plains, but there is quite a lot of cloud coming in from the east. It does look quite ominous. So there you go. That looks quite sort of devastating so I'm hoping we're not going to get wet so we're going to try and just see if we can check around twin dams first see if there's any sign of some elephants because Seb seems to be the elephant whisperer with Jamie when I was on walk with him the other day we had an incredible sighting of a male elephant close to us on a termite mound and then last night Seb had a great sighting with Jamie so I'm going to try to see if there's any ellies around there might also take a turn past Chitwa Dam and the reason why we're going to do all of these things is because Rusty is back up and running so we've got good old Rusty out again and Rusty's signal is very good in those areas so I think we'll go and try our luck and see what's happening there but it's a good day today since all the cars seem to be touch wood back in a working order which is very very good news. Now Kirsty's just informing me that I might have to open the show as well well that's okay Kirsty no problem can do all of that we are men and talents on this vehicle aren't we Sebastian? Of course, there we go. Hello Impalas, good afternoon gentlemen. Looking quite dapper this afternoon. They've... There we go, sorry Sebastian, that was my fault. So our Impalas are just trotting away. That's not very nice of you gentlemen. Well, maybe they're just saving it all for the main show, Seb. There is one, yes, a young male that is drifting off. So this is a little bachelor group that will probably be close to a female herd that is somewhere behind us around the dam I would imagine for those of you who have been watching the dam camp I'm sure there's quite a few impalas around there at the moment they like to come to the dam at this time of the day it's nice and warm and they know there's not going to be too many predators and as we know last night there was a male lion at the dam there was calls of leopards so being at the dam at night is not the most sensible maneuver but during the day it's more than pleasant Ah, oh, there's all the ladies, Sebastian. Yep. Not far away as normal. Hello, girls. They're all looking quite lovely in this late afternoon, well, early afternoon sunlight, should I say. I'm sure we shall see them on quarantine a bit later, Sebastian. What do you think? Oh, yes. Bye, ladies. Have a nice afternoon. Off to yourselves. I wonder if it's going to rain. I hope it doesn't rain. Rain is never the best story, so I'm hoping that we're not going to get rain. It definitely makes things a little bit more difficult, and our TV shows are coming up this weekend, and rain would not be the most welcome sight, so I'm hoping this is all bark and no bite. And right, well, we're going to start the show, so we'll see you in a few seconds, but we need to press some buttons and do some things, so we'll see you all in a few seconds. This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. There is a storm brewing, the clouds are rolling in. It is a beautiful afternoon and there is a threat of rain. This is Safari Live. Ready?
Good afternoon, good afternoon everybody and welcome to your Thursday Sunset Safari here from the wilds of wildest Southern Africa. It is a glorious 25 degrees Celsius and 77 degrees Fahrenheit. My name is James Hendry and I will be your host for this evening. Well that's not strictly true, I'm just going to be yakking at you from the tent as I normally am. Hashtag Safari Live is how you get hold of us and the reason for this well slightly repetitive beginning is the same as we had yesterday afternoon I hope it looked slightly better today is of course because we are practicing for our television special coming up on the weekend we are going to be broadcasting two live shows uh, on US television from three o'clock to five o'clock Central African time you can of course Watch them on the internet as you always do if you'd like to, that's no problem. But they will be from 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock on sun Saturday and on Sunday, so a Mother's Day weekend special. We're going to head across to Tristan now. I'm not sure what he's doing, I'm not sure where he's going, I'm not even sure what he's driving. In fact, we are not going anywhere near Tristan because he has got no signal. Good. So, let us go back into the tent. It's such a pleasant afternoon out here. And, oh, I forgot. There are two, three schools joining us, and you know, I've been so amazingly poor about checking who they are that I don't remember, and I'm going to ask Kirsten to tell me again. Diamond Springs, Mary K. Good, and College Park, elementary schools all. You're all from Virginia Beach, Virginia, and you are seven, six to seven years old. You're tiny, tiny people. Tiny people, come with me. I didn't realize you were so tiny today. Now you must please talk to us over the course of the next little while while you're in your classroom. You can do that through your teacher. You just ask her any question you like and we'll do our very best to answer. Okay. I've got Fergus, he's my friend on camera today, hello. and he's filming me, that's him saying hello. And we are hopefully going to find you some wonderful things around the tent, but my friend Tristan, he's out in the wilderness right now, and he's managed to find something that is quite similar to an American bison. We have indeed, James. We've managed to find the African version of a bison, and that is a Cape Buffalo. Now, my name is Tristan, and on camera today I've got Sebastian, and we are out here to try and show you as many things as we can from the African wilderness. Now, the African buffalo that we have lying in that wallow, which we'll get to in a little bit, is quite an interesting fella. They're quite aggressive and can be really, really dangerous. You have to be quite careful around them. Luckily in the cars, the buffalo is actually not too bad and we can stay quite close and we can then watch as they sit and wallow and spend their time in the beautiful afternoon light and take the time to have a little swim. Now, remember, you can ask any questions that you want to ask about the buffalo. You can ask your teachers and they will send through the questions if you want to know more about these beautiful animals. And these are both males. These are two boys that have found each other and made a sort of friendship. And they'll be protecting one another from predators. And you find that they'll often come to places like this in the afternoon because it's been quite hot today. So when the sun is out and it's shining, because they're very big animals, it's like us. We get very, very hot in the sun. So they then go towards the mud wallow where they climb in and they'll go and lie there and they sit and they just get nice and cool and the other reason why they go there is because they are helping to get rid of parasites so when we talk about parasites we're talking about ticks and varying other little sort of organisms that live on the buffalo that cause the buffalo to scratch and to itch and it's very uncomfortable and so they go and lie in the water because there's a little freshwater turtle that can eat all of those ticks and also you see the birds that are flying around those will come and land and help to keep the buffalo nice and clean so those are called oxpeckers and there's red-billed oxpeckers now I know there's been a yellow-billed oxpecker hanging around and those are quite rare we don't see them too much so I'm trying to see if there's any yellow-billed oxpeckers there but it looks like all red builds at the moment and those ones you can see don't have red beaks at all or yellow beaks and that's because those are the babies so those are the little ones that are still growing and their beaks will change color as they get a little bit older but you can see how they're working trying to get rid of those parasites So Ethan, you want to know what buffaloes eat? Well, buffaloes eat grass. 
mostly anyway, and they will try and feed off all the grass that we have in this area. You can see there's some on the edge of the water there, and those are the kind of things that they like to feed on. Sometimes though, when it gets very, very dry, like it did last year, last year we had a drought, which means that we didn't get enough rain for the grass to grow, then the buffalo will sometimes eat the leaves off the trees. But it's very, very bad for the buffalo to eat the leaves off the trees, the leaves contain a chemical called tannins and those tannins are very bad for the buffalo's tummy and it makes him have an upset stomach and he can actually do a lot of damage to his tummy and maybe even die from it. So they're supposed to only eat grass, they're like a cow in that way, they're grass feeders and they have a very special tummy which has got a four chambered stomach which means that when they eat their grass they can then come and lie here when it's hot and they can bring up balls of grass back into their mouth and re-chew them so that they gain all the nutrients and they don't have to spend the entire day in the hot sun feeding. They can spend time relaxing and resting and still gaining all the nutrients that they need to survive. Anthony, you're wondering if we could ride one of these. Well, Anthony, I suppose you could try, but it's not probably going to end up very well. A buffalo is a very, very grumpy animal, so if you tried to go and jump on that buffalo, you're going to have a very tough time. I think the buffalo would more than likely hurt you very, very badly. They don't like when people come very close to them, and often they'll chase you up into a tree, and they've got very nasty horns, so you wouldn't want to get too close to a buffalo. So I think it would be a very bad idea to be trying to ride a buffalo, but it's not to say that somebody maybe couldn't I suppose you could do it but it would be a very 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 bad idea also these animals out here are all wild animals so they're not used to people coming very very close and so you're gonna end up with a situation if you do get too close then they might get scared and either run away or they're gonna try and attack you to defend themselves and make sure that you don't hurt them but I see there's a third buffalo that's just coming from the back now so he's a sneaky little buffalo that's been behind the trees and you can see how well they actually camouflage can you see him there yeah. there he is he's coming out of the dark thickets and so he actually blends in very very well and he's coming to join his friends these three have actually been hanging around quite a bit the last few days we've been seeing them fairly often which is nice and the other one is now stood up I wonder if he's going to just turn around so you can see the water is not very deep at all that's why he's lying there oh we've got a bit of rubbing up against one another so Hayden you're wondering why they have horns. Well, the horns are there for, so that they can defend themselves from predators like lions. If a lion tries to jump onto this buffalo, it can use its horn and try and hit that lion and try and chase it away with those horns. And the other reason why they've got horns is to protect their skulls from when they fight, when they are trying to determine a territory. So when we talk about a territory, buffalo will try and have an area that they set up like us as people we have a home with our garden and that's how the buffalo does it they will try and have an area that they can then sort of challenge other males and chase them away and then have females there and start a family so that's why they have those horns is to be able to then fight with one another oopsie it's time to go to the toilet so you can see a buffalo is a bit of a dirty animal they don't mind going to the toilet in the water that they lie in and sometimes will even drink so that's a very naughty buffalo I'm sure his friends are not going to be too happy with him at all <laughs> I certainly wouldn't be happy if my friend did that but <laughs> <laughs> let's see how the others react they don't seem to be too worried about it the one lying in the water and the one at the back seems to be fairly sort of okay with this whole process I'm sure it happens very often but you can see that he's a really really big animal look at all the muscles on his shoulders and around his neck absolutely massive and so that's why the only thing that really can hunt these guys is lions the lions are the only ones because they group together in a pride they're able to overpower these buffalo by combining their forces a buffalo of this size is weighing about 900 kilograms or almost 2,000 pounds so they really are very very heavy and all of their body is just strong muscles and so it takes a lot of lions to be able to bring them down and make a meal out of them but everybody seems quite relaxed with the fact that he went to the toilet they're all sort of taking it easy you can see that one is almost asleep his eyes are closing very very sleepy afternoon and why not it's a beautiful afternoon for a rest in the nice cool water now I believe James who's in his tent has found something very very interesting that he wants to show you up close 
I bet you all had a very loud, hard laugh when that buffalo took its poop in the water. Very disgusting buffalo, wasn't it? Look at this spectacular, spectacular creature. And I bet there's some of you going, Oh, careful, it's going to bite you. Look, it's coming towards me. Hello, my dear. Hello, how are you? It's lovely to see you. This is a mantis, everybody. And the mantis, although she's a predator, and that means she will eat other insects, she's not really harmful to me. She could possibly create a little bit of damage to my skin. If you look at the front of her legs there, she's got quite nasty claws, so she might open them as I move my finger towards her. Come on, open up. There you can see them. And she's sometimes called a praying mantis, and you can see why. Doesn't it look like she's praying? And she's just sitting on me because, well, I think she's quite comfortable there. You see, I had my I had my bath before I came to work today, and so obviously I'm not too smelly today. That's a good thing, don't you think? All right, let's leave her there. She's really very pretty. In fact, let's keep looking at her for now. <laughs> Dage, you wonder why it is that we do this show. Well, Dage, uh, uh, there are different reasons for why we do this show. You can see my back. I'm sorry I'm not looking at you. It's a little bit difficult because you're looking at the mantis. Uh, Dage, we, don't, we do this show because we enjoy it and because, well, you're in school, right? And there are lots of people in the United States and all around the world who can't be in Africa. And yet... Africa is very interesting to lots and lots of people. And now, these days, with the internet the way it is, we can help people. <gasps> it's sneaking up on me. Look how it's sneaking up on my, on my neck. It's going to touch me. Ooh. Ooh. Now, Angeli, you're wondering if the mantis bites. No, it doesn't bite. But it can scratch with those claws, but it won't scratch me. It's not trying to hurt me. So I just want to quickly finish Gage's story there. So there are lots of people around the world, Gage, who want to see Africa, but, you know, sometimes they can don't have enough money to come here, or sometimes they just will never have the opportunity to travel to Africa. And so we do this show to show them Africa every single day. Isn't that cool? Look, she's cleaning, cleaning her legs. Oh, this is wonderful. And look at her eyes. She's now looking backwards with the one eye. Oh, I think this is very, very special, everybody. She is a beautiful mantis, and she's obviously not very young. You can see she's missed her one piece of antenna there. I don't know if you can see that. The left antenna is missing a piece. Uh, Gage, you're wondering what she eats. Well, like I said, Gage, she eats other insects. She's a predator. So she will catch things like flies and butterflies, and sometimes she'll catch things like other mantises. And you know what? The female mantises like to eat the males. So the mummy mantises eat the daddy mantises, which is not great, is it? It's really not very nice. But she's not going to try and eat me, I don't think. What do you think? Do you think she's going to try and eat me? Depends if we get married or not. I suppose it does depend if we get married, says Fergus. Good. Now that is the mantis. We're going to leave her right there. And from this rather unattractive sort of a beaker, if you like, we've got a worm. And we're going to put the worm under the microscope. Now the microscope is huge fun because we can look at things in amazing detail. Let me just move it quickly so we can get a nice picture of this funny worm. Oh. Now, this thing looks like a worm, doesn't it? Well, it is a worm to some extent, but it is actually a larva, and that means that it's like a caterpillar. And one day you will learn how it is that a caterpillar becomes a moth or a butterfly. And sometimes things like beetles, well, they also make a worm like this before they become adult beetles. Now, if you look very carefully in there, you can see the bits and pieces moving inside the caterpillar. Isn't that amazing? I think that's very special. I'm just going to push him up a bit. 
Isn't that astounding? That's very special. So he's digesting, just like you are digesting your breakfast right now, and it's passing through your stomach, and the various bits and pieces of what is known as your digestive tract, well, that's what's happening right here with this quite astonishing little worm, which is actually probably going to be either a beetle or a moth. I think that's very special. Now, my friend Jamie Patterson is also out at the moment, and she had a very special time with some elephants yesterday. So why don't you ask her to tell you about that? I did have a very special time with elephants yesterday, and I will tell you about that in one second. But a very good afternoon to all of you, and <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> Welcome on the Sunset Safari. My name is Jamie and this afternoon Craig is on camera with me and a very special warm welcome to the schools joining us this afternoon. I hope you kids are excited. I hear James has been showing you some relatively disgusting things in his tent. Oh, James mentioned that I had an amazing elephant sighting yesterday and I did. I got to see a tiny baby elephant and not just one, but a couple of very young elephants playing in the sand. They were diving into the sand face first and climbing and posing. It was really very, very special. But the best part was then, the elephants came right next to us and there was a bit of a step that the elephants had to climb up. And the smallest baby couldn't quite get up. Mom got up and then she kept reaching down to try and pull her baby up with her. And it was really quite a struggle and it took the baby a long long time but I was a bit worried in the beginning because I was we were so close to the elephants and I didn't want to switch on the engine and scare them we were so close to the elephants I was scared that mom was going to get a bit upset with us because we were so close to her baby and maybe if she was worried it couldn't come up the step then she might have got a bit cross with us but she didn't at all she was perfectly perfectly relaxed so you never know, maybe we'll come upon that same herd, maybe we'll come upon a different herd of elephants. I know that that would make my day. I'm going to go off in search of anything exciting to show you, but I know that Tristan's me beaten me to it. Let's go back to the buffalo enjoying a day at the pool. So our buffalo are slowly but surely starting to move away. I think they've had enough pool time. Maybe they were a bit put off by their friends. Very unfriendly or very bad behavior by defecating in their water. But you can see, look at the size of those horns and that head and the big eye. Such beautiful animals. Ah, so Ashanti, you're wondering how buffaloes sleep. Well, the buffalo will sleep by how we saw them just now. They'll lie down sometimes in water, sometimes on land, and they just close their eyes and they sit and they sleep sometimes with their head up, or they'll lie on their sides with their horns resting on the ground, like we would lie down if we were going to go to bed, and that's how they end up sleeping. But with the buffaloes, it can't always be very fast asleep like we are. Sometimes when we go to bed, then we wake up in the morning and we haven't heard a single sound. A buffalo can't sleep like that, because otherwise it's going to get itself into trouble with the lions. Because the lions are going to come, and they're going to try and attack the buffalo, and if it's not awake, it can get hurt very, very badly. So you'll find with buffalo that they, even though they're sleeping, their ears are still listening, and any little sound that happens, the buffalo will open its eyes and it will look and make sure that it can see what's going on and make sure that there's no threat around it. Now you can see this buffalo is busy making his way out of his water hole. Antoine, you're wondering if people eat buffalo. Well, not very often. You can eat them, but the problem with them is that their meat tends to be very, very tough. So it's very chewy meat. And so normally if people use buffalo for food, they will do it in a pie or they'll do it as a stew or something like that where they can cook the meat for a long period of time and make sure that it gets nice and tender for them to eat it. But it's not very commonly used because there's a lot of other animals that taste much better than buffalo. So like our impala that are in the distance over there, unfortunately they're a little bit hidden but I'll go and show you what they look like now. They taste a lot better than buffalo and so people don't really use the buffalo too much anymore and don't really feed off it. Which is a good thing if you're a buffalo, not so good if you're another type of animal. Let's see now if we can try and find a better picture of 
these impalas. You alright there, Seb? Yeah, I'm good. There we go, Seb. Maybe let's before they run away. But there's our male impala that is just disappearing. So these male impalas, they're about the size of a white-tailed deer. Maybe a little bit smaller than your white-tailed deer. So I don't know if any of you know your deers and know how big they are. But that's about the size of that male impala. And the reason why he is on his own, or I think there might be one other there, is that it's now the time where the males are fighting. It's that time of the year where the males go and they clash horns and they try and chase each other around. So it's quite common to see a male impala by himself. Normally with impalas you would find in other times of the year lots and lots and lots of them together and they form a nice big herd. But because the males are fighting, unfortunately he has to then go off on his own. And the reason why we know he's a male is because he's got horns. So you see those big horns that come off there, the females don't have any horns at all. Now I wonder if any of you can tell me what the difference is between horns or antlers that a deer has. So if you know the difference you can tell your teachers and send through and see who can tell me what the difference between antlers and horns is and why I call these horns. Right Seb, I think let's carry on and while we give everybody a chance to answer that and see what else we can find. I want to just go and check another little water hole that's close by because sometimes the elephants like to come and drink there. It's also a good place for two little leopards that spend time in this area. So I want to go and check that water hole and make sure that they're not sitting there while we have all of you with us this afternoon. But that was a nice surprise with the buffalo. See they've all disappearing now into the riverbed so they are not going to be seen for the rest of the day, I don't think. It's going to be very thick in there, so nobody's going to find them, I don't think. And our Impala has also now run off into the thicket. Oh no, there's another one there. But it is such a beautiful afternoon, and such a nice day to be driving out in the bush. And one of my good friends is in another part of Africa, and he's got a very special surprise for you. So let's go say hello to Brent. Hi, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, welcome to all the schools. Guess what? You've just jumped all the way about 2,000 kilometers from South Africa to Kenya. And we're with a pride of lions, the Angama pride of lions. They have seven cubs. There are three females with them at the moment. They're lying on the edge of a deep, deep little... But we've followed them for the last couple of hours, and I'm hoping they're going to get up and move. We've also found a male lion that's not too far from here. But there we go, the Angama Pride. Lots of little cubs. I can't wait to hear your questions. Uh, my name is Brent. I have VM on camera, and we are in the Maasai Mara in Kenya. Aren't they just too cute? So I'm guessing these guys are about five months old. Uh, at the oldest, probably closer to four months. Now what we've done, everybody, is we've returned this rather remarkable insect back to the wild. Isn't that nice? We don't want to keep them away from the wilderness because this is where she really should be living, out in the wild. Sorry we had to cut quickly to us, sometimes a little bit difficult out here broadcasting because we're completely in the wilderness. It's like broadcasting all the way from Yellowstone National Park. So here she is and now she's going to wait. And what she will need to, be do, need to do, although she is a predator, she'll have to be careful because all around here there are lots and lots of things which might want to eat her. Birds would want to eat her. There might be some big spiders that might want to eat her. There could be, ooh, I don't know, maybe really large reptiles like, say, uh, I know, a tree agama maybe want to eat her. And even an enormous chameleon would eat her. And that's why she's this very clever color. She's this beautiful green color, and that's called camouflage. I don't know if you've learned about camouflage yet. But camouflage is a nice word because it means to remain hidden. And you can see that she's the same color as the leaf. And if I point on the back of her wings here, you can see that her wings look very similar to the leaves that she's walking amongst. Isn't that amazing?
I think that's very special. Now she's looking at me. You see, I think she misses me. Do you miss me, Mrs. Mantis? Hmm? You do? Hmm. See how she's standing praying? She's looking at me in the eye. Now, Josh, you say can a mantis fly? Yes, they can fly, Josh. Here are the wings. Where I'm pointing now, there are the wings, and they can fly. And I don't know why she didn't fly earlier when I picked her up, because mantises fly very well, and normally if you try and pick them up, they'll fly away. But I think maybe she just had a huge meal. She's looking quite fat to me. Maybe she's had a huge meal, or she's about to lay her eggs, perhaps. That's possible. There she goes. And you can imagine, if you were a bird looking for things to eat, it would be very difficult to see this mantis in amongst the leaves. Now, if she is about to lay her eggs, which she might be, because we're getting to the end of summer, well, we're at the end of summer, we're into winter now, what she will do is make an amazing, amazing little sack of silk into which she'll lay her eggs. Now, I believe my other friend Ronald has got something to see. What's he got to see, Kirsty? A terrapin? Let's quickly have a look what he's looking at. There is Ronald, everybody, and Ronald is looking at a terrapin. Now, I bet that you in the United States would call something like that a turtle. It is not a turtle. It is a terrapin. Can you all say terrapin on the count of three? One, two, three. Terrapin. Now, a terrapin is different from a turtle because it lives in fresh water, and a turtle lives in the sea. Isn't that beautiful? And what he's doing, oh, and there's a little lizard as well, just a little lizard scuttling past the front of Ronald's picture. Wonderful stuff. And the little terrapin is just thinking about, he's just thinking about staying warm, and at the same time he's looking at Ronald thinking, Goodness gracious me, what is the strange thing? Now, Ronald, I don't know if we've got a picture of the dam cam, do we, of Ronald? No, we don't. OK, well, Ronald looks like a little car. He looks like a little small car, like a little tank, actually. You all know what a tank looks like? Anyway, that's why it looks very strange to this terrapin, who's sitting there, breathing away and having a lovely time. Let's head across to Tristan, who has got some of my favourite pigs. Well, I didn't know that these were your favourite, James, but I'm sure you'll have some luck at some stage and maybe some will come wandering towards your tent and you'll be able to watch them from there. But yes, we do. We have these warthogs and they are at the little dam that I was talking about earlier. I was saying we were going to come to another water hole to see if maybe there was some elephants or anything else that might be around because it is quite hot this afternoon, so it's a perfect sort of temperature for animals to come down and have a little afternoon drink. And we found this beautiful family of warthogs. And now I'm not 100% sure how many there are there. I think, let's see, we'll count them together. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There we go, there's eight warthogs together, which is quite nice. So we've got probably a male and a female, and then her babies from last year. And it's quite often that you see that, to the male sort of hanging around, and normally it's a young male that might have been the offspring from the year before. So it might have been her baby from not last year October, the year before October, and they stay with their mom until she has her next lot of babies, and then he'll then make his way away from that area and go and find his own place. But those are the little ones that were born in October, so they are now about seven or eight months old, and so they're getting quite big already. When they're born, they are tiny, 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 and unfortunately when they're born, there's lots and lots of predators, so they have to be very careful. And that's why you can see they're feeding quite far from the edge of the water. They don't want to get too close to the water, because in case there are crocodiles here, and those babies would be a perfect snack for a crocodile. So, Hunter, you're asking why do the warthogs have horns? Well, Hunter, they don't have horns, they have what's called tusks. So there's a difference between horns and tusks, and I was asking you all earlier if you knew what the difference between antlers and horns was. So while we get onto that subject, let's talk about tusks and horns. Now tusks are actually a modified tooth. So those warthogs have big teeth that are sticking out, and they have those to defend themselves, much like the buffalo has the horns, the warthog has those horns to defend themselves from 
other predators like leopard and lions they'll try and use those tusks to fend them off and then also if they're fighting if the males are fighting amongst each other they use those to then fight with one another so those are called modified teeth or tusks and a horn is a little bit different a horn is a piece of bone that is attached to the skull that is covered by a sort of hardened hair like your fingernail called keratin and that's what forms a horn structure so slightly different and you'll find that most of our antelope species have horns but things like warthogs, hippos, elephants, they have tusks, which are these modified teeth. Now, isn't it funny the way that they feed? You'll sometimes see, you can see that warthog's had a good mud wallow. He was like the buffalo earlier. But you see how sometimes they go onto their knees to feed? Maybe the one at the back. There we go. Isn't that cute? So, a warthog is a very clever animal because it knows that it has to stretch to feed on grass. And so rather than stretching and kind of pushing its neck down and having to be uncomfortable it goes onto its knees so it's nice and comfortable to be able to eat and it's like if you're eating your hamburger much easier if you put your elbows on the table and you put your hamburger to your mouth it makes a lot more sense than trying to stretch and kind of eat down with a knife and fork it's much easier that way right so our warthogs are trotting off I'm going to carry on seeing if there's any sign of anything around the dam this is an area where there's like I was saying the two leopards like to hang around and so I want to check behind the dam wall because they like to lie in the shade there and you never know maybe we'll get a nice surprise on the other side here Ah, so he said that none of you are sure what the difference between horns and antlers are. So, antlers, which occur on most of the species that are in the northern hemisphere, is a cartilage. Now, cartilage is a part of your body that can grow and it, it keeps all of our bones together and attaches to them to make sure that our bones stay together. Now, cartilage then grows from the animal's head and it is therefore a sort of part of the season and then it falls off and goes away a horn is a bone it's like your arm growing from your head and once that breaks off there is no more and it will not come back again so the antlers will regrow every year but horns if it breaks that's the end of it right we're going to try and see if i can't find these elusive spotted cats and while we do that let's go back to jamie and see how she's doing and what she's doing and where she's exploring and whether she's had any luck this afternoon I'm also searching for elusive spotted cats and this morning we had one elusive spotted cat on a termite mound in the form of a young leopard called Hosanna. And the last time I saw Hosanna he was crouched on top of that termite mound over there hiding in the grass and you wouldn't believe how when a leopard wants to hide away it is so good at lying right down flat and disappearing behind the grass. Now, I've come back to this area just in case he's still around. And I'm sure he is still around somewhere. The question is where? He's not on the termite mound anymore. I have to be honest, I didn't expect him to be. It's hot. The sun is probably, well, it's definitely moved around, so the shade has moved around. I was hoping, though, that he might be somewhere in these shady spots on the ground. But if you're a leopard, they can lie right down flat in the long grass. Do you know how hard it is to find a leopard if it's lying flat in the long grass? He could be just over there, and I'd struggle to see him, and I'm not going to get out and show you what I mean, just in case he is there, and I give him a fright. I don't want to do that. Hmm. I wonder where he's gone. Well, the next trick, then, is to go and look at the water holes. That's all we can do. We can hope that he's gone there, unless I go and walk up and down and up and down and up and down. Now, Mariah, let's go from spots to stripes. You want to know if zebra live here. Zebra do live here. And we get a type of zebra called a plains zebra, or the old name is a birchal zebra. So, yes, we do get zebra. We go through times where we see lots of them and we go through times where we don't see that many of them. I haven't seen a zebra in a little while, but we do get them around here. They are around and that's something that we'll look to try and show you as well. Our leopard's spots work really well to help to hide it in long grass. A zebra stripes, one of the ideas as to why they have stripes is it might actually work in a similar way with the animals all together when they run away from a predator, it becomes hard for a lion or whatever's hunting them to pick out an individual. What do you think, kids? Which way should we go? 
Where do we think this leopard is hiding? I can't keep driving round through this block until, or through the bush until I find him. That would be terribly silly and do unnecessary damage. So I guess we've got to go and look for his footprints. Now, apparently his sister was just a little bit further to the south in that direction. Maybe he's gone to go and join his sister. That's also a possibility, especially if she managed to catch something to eat, then there's no doubt in my mind that he would go and join her. Because they're still young, they're spending quite a lot of time together. They're only 15 months old, so not even a year and a half old yet. So it might be that he's gone to go visit his sister or she came here and they moved off together. That's what we've got to go and figure out. I just want to go through here quite slowly just in case he is hiding here. He's very, very comfortable with cars. So he might not even stick his head up, which means I have to search carefully. Uh, both here in South Africa and in the Mara, it is nice and warm, which means the cats are all sleeping in the shade. Let's head back across to Brent in the Mara with a male lion. Well, Jamie is searching for a male leopard, Hosanna, one of our favorites. We've got the first glimpse of a male lion, one of four that lord over this northern part of the Mara Triangle. And uh, they don't really have a coalition name yet. Now, they also go across the river to the Marsh Pride. Now, I'm just going to try to show you quickly because he's snoozing. Okay, so pretty much behind those that line of trees, there's some very green area there. And that's, that's the famous marsh where the Marsh Pride tend to hang out. And as I said, the, this is the coalition that's over the Angama Pride. And they're an offshoot from the Marsh Pride. And he is a big, beautiful boy. And there he is. He's not too far from the females and cubs, probably about oh, 200 meters, maybe not even that far. But he is being very, very lazy. And he hasn't moved since we found him. And he's probably not going to move too much. Hi, Caden. Caden is wondering, do lions eat grass? Caden, uh, they do, but not very often. So lions are predators and carnivores, which means they eat meat. Sometimes you will see lions eating grass when they've got an upset tummy. Uh, they'll eat the grass to try help their tummy, but normally they like buffalo, wildebeest, zebra, giraffe, and all the other animals out here. So lions eat the other animals, so they are meat eaters, carnivores. And it is just a glorious afternoon here. Jade, hello. Nice to hear from you. Jade would like to know, do all lions have manes? Uh, Jade, they do not. Only the boys and then only again the adult boys or the big boys have manes. And the reason they have manes is to protect their neck and back of their head and their throat when they are fighting for other with other male lions so male lions will fight for girlfriends and territory so that's why they have the, developed or evolved this big mane it's to help them protect themselves when they are fighting now the females which we saw very for a very short time a little bit earlier they don't have manes a male will only really start developing his mane properly from about two years old where it's, it's quite visible but it'll only be fully developed at about six years old and I would say he is definitely an adult, probably somewhere between 6 and 10 years old. I haven't really had a good look at his face yet, but maybe I'd say just looking at him, he looks quite in quite good nick. So maybe not as old as 10, uh, maybe 6 to 6 to 8 years old. And he's doing what lions do best at this time of the day, and that's snooze. So a male lion will probably sleep for about 20 hours a day, every day, and uh, only move around for four hours. And generally that is after dark, or when it's cool in the early morning and late afternoon. So there is a possibility he might get up and move soon. So we're not going to move too far. I think we're just going to keep going up and down between him and where the, the females and the babies are. And I'm hoping they're going to join together later. Now Gage is wondering how fast are lions. Gage, they're really fast, but they can only be very fast for a short period of time. Gage, they can do up to about 
20 meters per second, but they can't keep it up for very long. So very, very fast is the answer. Much faster than you, me, or Usain Bolt. I'm just trying to see if the lionesses have started moving back towards us. Ah, now we're going to make our way back towards where the, the females and the babies are. But while we do that, James has got the little five, well, a member of the little five who's named after the big five, Lion. Hello. Yes, I think I understand what Brent meant. We've got here some very special holes in the ground. Now, some of you and I don't mean any of the kids, but some of you adults would have been watching yesterday evening, and because we've got a TV show on the weekend, which of course all of you can watch on Nat Geo Wild, then I thought I would just try and see if we could do it again. You can see I've excavated here. I've taken the creature out of the bush, uh, out of the sand, and he's sitting in the tent now waiting for us. But this is where they normally live. And this is called an antlion, and if you watch carefully, you might just be able to see him kicking sand out. No, he's not. No, never mind. I have caught one, and I'm going to show you how he digs and how he lives. But before we do that, look here. See, Fergus? There's a tiny little insect. Oh, it's flown away. Sorry about that. There's also a tiny little spider. Can you see on the grass stalk here? See there? There he goes. We've got him. Mm. Beautiful little tiny, probably jumping spider. And he'll be hunting the same things that the antlions are waiting for. Now what the antlions are doing is they're waiting for ants to fall into their pits. And here comes an ant. Oh, watch, here comes an ant. There, yeah, he turned the right way. You see, he turned the right way, so he's not going to fall into this pit. And the antlion, if the ant falls in there, will catch him and suck him dry. He will eventually, well, he'll die. Okay, come inside with me now. We've got something special to show you. Let's have a look at the ant lion quickly first, I think, if that's all right. Is that fine, Kristen? Right, now, in here I've got two things, and this is what's so nice about being in the tent. There's the ant lion. And I'm just going to show you how small he is first. He's a tiny little thing there in the bottom right-hand corner. There you go. You can just see his little pincers. And we'll put him under the microscope now and show you what he looks like. And then we're going to show you how he digs. And that's really quite fun. Okay, here we go. Let's put him under here. There he is. I bet you can hardly see him. Can you see him there? Now what he's trying to do is dig into this little plastic box that he's in. He doesn't know, doesn't understand why he can't dig because his brain is very, very small. I know some people with brains this small, but this is a really small-brained antlion. Okay, you see that? And you can see the spikes on the top of his head, and those are used to catch ants. Right, now what we're going to do, and we're going to have to be quite quick about this, so come back to me, Kirst. Kirsten is directing, by the way. What we're going to do is we're going to put him into the sand here, and then I'm going to quickly put the microscope on him before he can dig underneath, and we're going to watch him dig. Okay, let's go. Uh, wait, there he is, there he is, there he is. Now let's see if he digs. Are you going to dig? Look at his eyes. He's thinking about digging. Now, Dana, you want to know why it's called an antlion? It's just because it's so good at eating ants, Dana. That's why. There, he's starting to dig now. He's starting to dig with his bottom. And you see how cleverly camouflaged he is? Remember, we spoke about camouflage, and we spoke about the mantis that was camouflaged. There, look, he's digging. I'm just trying to keep the picture right. It's not great. There we go. Now he's starting to dig. You can see he's flicking his bottom. There he goes. Look. Oh. 
Here he goes. He's going to go all the way under the ground there. Isn't he clever? And he's going to disappear completely. And now I'm going to show you the sand where he's gone, and you won't be able to see him. All right, so if you come back to me now, what you'll see is if Fergus shows you the sand, you can't see him. He's gone completely. Isn't that just the best? So now we're going to put him back in the soil because you must remember in the wilderness we want to leave the wilderness as we found it. We don't want to have too much effect on the wilderness. So I'm going to put him back and he's going to live hopefully happily ever after. Let's head back to Jamie just now. I must just say good <laughs> goodbye to all of you. Uh, thank you for joining us on our little safari. I hope you enjoy the rest of your days at school. Okay, so you go and have a good day at school and for the rest of you we're going to head back to Jamie. <laughs> a very good afternoon to all of you and welcome to the continuation of our sunset safari. My name is Jamie and this afternoon Craig is on camera with me and I absolutely agree with James in that we want to leave the wilderness exactly as we find it. The only thing that we will ever leave behind, of course, is footprints. And speaking of footprints, I've got some exciting footprints going in the direction... Oh, now they're going back the other way. What were these elephants doing? I was going to say there's a whole host of elephant tracks heading towards Treehouse Dam, but that was 10 meters ago. Now these tracks over here are going the opposite way. What have these elephants been doing? Well, it's hot. I'm hoping we're going to get lucky and we're going to get a herd of elephants at Treehouse Dam because our search for Hosanna has been not... Well, basically, the, the mystery of Hosanna has been solved by Tristan, who tells me that there's tracks going south into Little Gowrie. So that's the little leopard that we were looking for earlier. I was so hoping we could show the kids the hymn, but it's just one of those things, the wild out here unpredictable which way the animals are going to go. What is predictable though is just how fresh this is. Now let me show you. First of all, when you're looking at evidence left behind by a herd of elephants walking along the road, here we go, that's oopsie, oopsie daisy. This has been stripped by said elephants and you'll usually find after a while Maybe just a couple of hours it'll start to get dry and brittle. But these leaves are still fresh and green and still supple, so there's still moisture in them. And these elephants have come down this road in the last few hours, I would say, but I almost, if I find some dung, I almost want to say even less than a few hours, maybe just an hour ago. Now the tracks are on top of all of the other vehicle tracks, which is wonderful news because it means there's probably, well, there's a very good chance that we're going to find them and I'm hoping we're going to find them up ahead. So while I follow along the tracks of several different elephants, let's go and see what the drone is seeing from its eye in the sky. <whistles> Right, there we are. See, we're in the sky. <laughs> we're looking at some nyalas there. I found myself thoroughly amusing, as you can see. Uh, right, I'll tell you what I'll be doing out there shortly, but first let us observe this magnificent nyala bull. He's uh, just walking along, really, looking for some grazing. Some browsing. Sorry, I'm getting horribly tongue-tied this afternoon. I'm not sure why. My brain is not functioning as it perhaps should be. I will attempt to better, do better from this point. If you have just joined us, hashtag Safari Live is how you talk to us. And that, of course, is on the Tweet Tweet, that little blue bird you can see at the bottom of your screen, which, of course, has nothing to do with the Nyala we're looking at now. Now, these are my favorite antelope. I think they are by far and away the most magnificent. They are the most varied in color, of course. And I don't know, there's something about them that I find particularly appealing, especially when they're in mortal combat. And they get into mortal combat very seldom. Most of the time, they just sort of posture at each other, erecting that beautiful white mantle on their backs. And then sometimes they will have the most almighty fights. With, and the skill displayed 
as they sort of parry and thrust at each other is quite astonishing. There, as you saw, Connor showed you a gorgeous view of our landscape, which is turning sort of golden honey at the moment, mixed in with a little bit of green, but very different from the height of the summertime. And also, what also always amazes me is when we look at the landscape from the air like this, is how much more open it seems from this perspective than when you are driving at ground level. So you've been down with Jamie and with Tristan, of course, and you've been on bushwalk many times, most of you, and you've seen how it almost looks impenetrable in places. But when you get up into the air, the perspective is quite different. And so you can see the space that the animals have to move. You can see exactly where, if you were a lion, you would be hiding. And the best part of this little picture there is that the Snyala was, he just turned off it, he was walking on the game path. And I love the game paths. They just make me feel like there's a sense of real history of the place. Ancient pathways that animals have followed for centuries to and from water holes. Maybe not centuries, maybe just a couple of weeks, given <laughs> depending on whether there's a pumped pan nearby or not. Uh, but you know what I mean. Going down to the big rivers. I think that's rather pretty. Now, the reason I was outside was that we were looking for the cause of the consternation being sort of expressed by some squirrels over there and some rattling cesticulars over that way. I couldn't find anything, but you know, every single day for the last four days that we've been in the tent like this, round about now, in fact, slightly later once the sun has gone down, we've had birds alarm calling around here, almost like a predator's come to the Galago pan to have a drink and then melted away again before anybody could actually see him or her or it couldn't really be an it, it must be a him or a her. So maybe Shongile is around here, not sure. Now Rick, you're wondering if there is a program to increase some of the populations of animals around here. Um, not in the laboratory sense, if you know what I mean. So uh, there is no program of artificial insemination or breeding programs in this area specifically. But there are programs to look after endangered species. The wild dog is the most obvious one. Just about every pack in the Kruger Park has an alpha male or female that has a collar around the neck, and that helps them to monitor what the packs are doing. And if the packs get into trouble, if they get out of the reserve, if there happens to be some sort of disease that they've got infected with, well, then the humans will intervene. But there's no program as such to make their numbers greater other than that. The greatest program, of course, that we can have to increase the number of species and the biodiversity of an area like this is to protect it from human interference. And that includes the interference of the conservation authorities. So the best thing we can do for increasing the endangered species of this area is to just leave them alone. Then sometimes for example, there are numerous elephants in the Kruger Park. If somebody starts a reserve, buys an enormous tract of land somewhere in South Africa, you can phone the Kruger Park and say, Oi, I need some elephants. And they'll say, well, if you pay to, pay to get them, we'll give them to you. And I think there's probably very little money that passes hands there because elephants are abundant here and they want to spread elephants as far and wide as possible. Same thing with wild dogs. They would take a pack of wild dogs from here, habituate it to an area and move it into an area like that. Now, outside of an area like this, absolutely, there are breeding programs to breed endangered species and then re-release them into the wild. But that... Those programs you need to look at very carefully. Some of them are very ineffective. Some of because it's so difficult to introduce animals into the back into the wild. So it can be that the best intentions in the world are meant by a breeding program, but it can be very difficult to take animals back into the wild. So that's a kind of answer for your question. What have you got there? There was a wops. There was a wops. Carrying a bit of a I'm going to try and f find this wops that was carrying a caterpillar. While I do that, Jamie, apparently, I thought she had an elephant, but it must be Casper, the invisible elephant. Casper, the invisible elephant. And Casper, the invisible elephants that leave footprints and then don't apparently come out anywhere. The footprint, the trail just died. The tracks just disappeared. And I have no idea where these elephants have gone, so I'm going to guess and try and figure it out. Unless the reason that I saw tracks backwards and forwards is that they've gone back on themselves and back south across our boundary. But I hope not. 
I'm going to take a guess and go and check a road up ahead of me. Maybe they've popped out there. It's exactly what happened to me yesterday with that herd of elephants. They came from one direction and I parked my vehicle assuming that they were going to continue on in a different direction and they didn't. They just stayed. I wonder if this hornbill knows. Gives me an opportunity to stop and listen for branches breaking and the other sounds of elephants feeding. Have you by any chance seen some elephants? Oh, big yawn. Sorry, am I boring you, hornbill? No? That is a yellow-billed hornbill. And for our new viewers, a lovely bird to start off your bird lists that I'm sure you all diligently keeping. For our regular viewers, I imagine if you haven't seen a yellow-billed hornbill by now, then we're definitely doing something wrong. There is the somewhat rarer, in fact, you know what, we've got all three species, all three smallish species here, I think. I think, if I go forward a little bit, oh, oh it just flew away. I'm going to say there's a grey, the grey hornbill and a red bull. All in one collection. No, it's there, it's there, it's there. Please don't fly away. They're so much shyer for some reason. There's... Can you see it there, Craig? I don't want to get any closer in case it flies off. Here we go. Marvellous. Now we just need the red bulled, and we've completed the more commonly seen hornbill, small hornbill species. There, is that a red bulled on the left there, Craig? Uh, the, just the left of the bird we were on. There you go. No, nope, yellow bolt. Yellow bolt. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> nope, still have to add red bolt to our collection. Of course, the yellow bolt has the most robust bull of all of the smaller hornbill species that we see. An eclair, that does immediately put one in mind of a toucan, does it not? You're not the first person to ask and to wonder about whether or not they are closely related to toucans. They are not closely related to toucans at all. They are completely separate. Now, toucans, which is something I didn't actually know up until a friend of mine told me about it, a friend of mine with an odd obsession with toucans, and I'm not entirely sure where it comes from, but he tells me that Toucans can use their beaks for thermoregulation, which is something that our hornbills don't do at all. So they're completely separate families, and of course we don't get toucans here. And the bull, I guess, is an example of where nature has evolved to have very similar approaches in completely different parts of the world, which happens with lots of different things. I mean, discussing with Tristan the difference between deer and antelope, and the fact that essentially they fill a very similar ecological niche with just some minor or major differences. I was so hoping that while I was nattering on about the hornbills that I would hear the elephants. But it was not to be. Oh, we've got another hornbill flut fluttering in. Any chance it's a red bull? It's not often that we would get all three species in one sighting, but no, I think that's the yellow build again. Okay. I can hear a woodpecker somewhere. But I think past our field of view. Ah. <laughs> Wonder where these elephants have gone. My plan, by the way, for the end of the sunset safari is to do a very serious, very focused hyena den search. I want to go and see if we can figure out where they've moved, because I think they have moved. And Herbie agrees, he also thinks they've moved. Herbie, by the way, is an eminently competent guide and tracker who works for Juma, but also helps to keep us safe when we're out on foot. Not an elephant, and no longer not an impala, actually. Let's just run away. No, disappeared. Oh, I'm quite 
devastated by my disappearing elephants, but it seems that James has decided to keep you entertained with a horrifying story. It is a horrifying story, the likes of which is going to make your toes curl underneath until breaking point. You are going to go cold. Your throat is going to leap into your mouth. Because that's how I feel right now. Now, if Fergus brings the camera gently round to this side, what you will notice is that there is some silk sort of strewn about gently. You see that? Gently strewn about silk there underneath the chair. Right, that's very nice. Now, I thought to myself, I wonder who made that silk? And of course that silk has been there now, boy, I don't know, about a week. While we've been sitting here, I thought, let me just quickly check. Between the layers here on my seat, and notice that there is a hole here. Okay, do you see this? There is a hole there. There is the hole. Okay, good, so you've seen that. And I thought, well, let me just split this apart. And uh, let's see what's there. And lo and behold, there is the most enormous brown button spider that I have ever seen. It has been sitting within b uh, half an inch of my nether regions for the last week. And I now know no longer know what to do about this chair. Well, I do know what to do about it. I'm going to throw it away. That is terrifying. It's utterly, utterly horrifying. And I think that is Lactrodectrus geometricus again. In fact, it might be a different species of brown button spider because there are no bubbles or baubles on the top of the egg sac, which he's still making. Now, tell me, everybody, I would like to know in one word tweet how it would make you feel if you had realised that for the last week you had been sitting on top of one of Africa's most venomous spiders not more than half an inch from what can only be described as the most sensitive part of your body. Well, I am quite sure that, like me, you would feel perplexed in the extreme. Oh. Especially when you noticed that there was a slit that it could easily have climbed up through to get at you. That is a magnificent shot. Well done, Fergus. I, did, I think it is Electrodectrus geometricus, given the hourglass there. Uh, but it is the biggest one I've ever seen. Oh, look at that thing. Filled with nasty venom. Right, well, I mean, what an appropriate tweet from a chap, or what an appropriate Twitter handle from the first one-word tweet. The tweet is Lucky, and it comes from somebody called The Evil Underwear Gnome. Well, yes, The Evil Underwear Gnome, I'd say Lucky is a very, very apt description of how I feel right now, although horrified comes to mind, terrified... Yes, and George, you may have the um, sort of hyphenated word there, bone-chilling. Very bone-chilling indeed. Hmm. Anyway, and uh, you know, I mean, this would be extreme TV, wouldn't it? It'd be like Fear Factor. Maybe I should carry on sitting in this thing for Saturday and Sunday, see if I can survive unscathed. I'm obviously not going to do that because that would be stupid. Put another set of undies on. Yeah, no. Fergus, your, your wasp is back. Excellent. Sorry, I've just dropped this. You keep looking there. I'll see if I can spot your wasp that was carrying a caterpillar. <laughs> Fergus, that is a very brave shot that you're attempting there. You can't really see your hands, can you? <laughs> Isn't that a beautiful... I mean, it is a beautiful spider. It really is. A beautifully backlit shot. Do you want some more light on it? No, uh, we're all right. You're right. 
Okay, well, from what I think is the most terrifying incident I've ever had in the wilderness out here, I'm going to have to lie down for a while. We're going to head across to the Mara with Brent Leo Smith and, uh, well, probably the most terrifying predator they have there. Well, we are moving all along from a creature with eight legs to one with four, but that is snoozing. So you can't see the rest of the lionesses. They're in the grass around there. So we dashed across to the other side of the lugger. Now, a lugger is a donga, or a big ravine uh, in Swahili. And uh, we wanted to be on the right side where the lionesses were for when they got moving. Now, if we come up from this side and we look up towards the escarpment, up towards Angama, on that hill are zebra, giraffe, uh, coax heart beast, topi, and uh, buffalo. Now, Andy, oh, there you can just see the giraffe. You see the giraffe here? In the distance there. Now, even though at the moment the Angama Pride seems to, to specialize in Wartok, there's a male around, so there's a good chance that they might get moving and head towards that mass of animals on the short grass around the escarpment. And uh, we, we just wanted to be on the right spot to follow them when they got moving, because I think what they're going to do is move towards this little road we're on and then head up towards the escarpment. Now, the cubs are still running around. They pop up and about every now and then and uh, I am hoping they will pop up onto that termite mound again and join one of the adult females. Now you've always got to be quite careful because to get around this lugger we had to go a long long way and I just hope that one or the other lionesses haven't snuck off so I'm constantly scanning around. Now remember we are live from the Maasai Mara in Kenya more specifically we're right in the northern corner of the Mara Triangle and uh, it is an incredibly beautiful and incredibly productive area and uh, that's why this lion pride is doing so well and it's one of the most stable lion prides in the Mara Triangle. Remember hashtag Safari Live uh, if you have any questions for us about the Mara, the lions, the, well, everything and, and anything to do with this beautiful stunning part of the world. Now, on our first safari here, oh, then if we go down to the Samaki Swamp, now the Samaki, Samaki means fish in, 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 in Swahili, and it's a, it's a long way away from us here, but it is incredible the distances you can see. There must be a hundred or so elephants spread over the swamp. Can you see them there, Vim? Look at that. Now, we were actually on our way down towards the Samaki Swamp till we found the lions and they are quite a few of them are looking quite hungry so we decided to to wait it out uh, with the lions and oh, I'm sure we will get to show you the Samaki Swamp in the next couple of days I'm very excited to just show you every single new area and it is just the most in beautiful 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 place Well, Karen says it is so gorgeous here. Uh, Kenya is definitely on her bucket list. Well, Karen, maybe you'll see VM and I bombing around the Mara looking for lions and leopards and cheetahs and other creatures. Hayden is wondering, do lions attack giraffes here? And well, apparently they do quite often. And as I said, I'm still learning what's going on here, which is, makes it even more exciting for me. But they do actually, uh, the day before we arrived, a pride to the sort of southeast of us uh, apparently killed a baby giraffe. But they have been known when the males are present to take adult giraffe as well. The thing that I find almost, uh, almost unbelievable, especially after all the time I've spent in the bush in southern Africa, is that there were four lionesses and they had a single buffalo bull by himself. And the buffalo chased them and chased them for a good 50 or 60 meters. And they had no interest in even attempting to grab onto such a big, dangerous beast, unlike our beloved Inkahumas of the Sabi Sands, who see a buffalo and their eyes light up. Now, there's a couple of reasons for this. There is just so much more food around here that they are not forced to go after the big prey like buffalo. 
and uh, they specialize while the wildebeest aren't here it mostly in, in in warthogs from what the guides tell me but when the males are around they will go for buffalo and uh, so quite interesting how huh? and one must remember that a lot of animal behavior is area specific rather than species specific so the lions and the mara are going to behave differently to the lions and the sabi sands in some ways and we've already seen how they really love to use a tree to, to, to rest in to get away from the flies uh, today nice and windy so the flies will be battling so the lions not needing to scamper up into the into the boughs of a shepherd's tree to escape the biting flies at the moment and uh, it's going to be interesting. We're going to learn a lot and we're going to see some behavior that we're not used to while we're in the morrow. So it is, it is so exciting. Hi, Monique, who's in London. Monique is wondering, have I seen Scarface, the very famous male lion yet? Uh, I have not. Uh, I heard he swam the Mara River and he's actually on the other side of the river at the moment. Apparently his limp is a bit better and he's looking a bit healthier than he was. Now, tomorrow we're probably going to go head down into the area uh, that Scarface frequents in the triangle side and who knows, maybe a little bit of lion luck is in order and we'll see that gorgeous big boy. Now we're still in the rainy season at the moment and you can see there are some clouds building. We have some forecast for rain over the next few days, but you have these wonderful big thunderstorms. You can actually drive around them, but you can see forming up on the escarpment. Now when the clouds, from what I've learned and chatting to people, when the clouds form in this area, the prevailing winds are going to push them towards Lake Victoria, but when the clouds form to the almost directly north of us or northeast of us the rain is going to hit us now i actually could see some rain a bit earlier it looks like it's dissipated so often you'll just see these patches of rain and you can actually plan your safari to avoid the rainstorms as you drive around of course you do get um, the great deluges that you cannot avoid at any cost uh, but we are all prepared don't worry uh, we won't get too wet uh, the cameras and equipment definitely won't Oh, it's so beautiful. Ah, hello, James. James is asking, besides the shepherd's tree, uh, what other trees are common there? Now, I'm still learning the trees, um, but some of the, the, the bushes and stuff I know. Have you got that tree there, Vim? One to the right of the lioness. Now, that is a Balanites, a torchwood. But it is not the same one uh, we get in, 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 in South Africa. It is Egypt something. Oh, I can't remember. My, my brain is, is failing me. But it is a torchwood, but it's Egypt, uh, Egypt, 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 obviously named after Egypt. But I cannot for life of me remember the full scientific name. <gasps> Naughty Brent. I'm going to have to beat myself and scold myself and get back to my books later. Now, and we along the river, it's very interesting. You've got uh, Walbergias and... Um, Egyptia. There we go. Thank you, Master Henry and Juma. Um, you've got Walburgias. You've got a different species of, 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 of Diospirus, which is a jackalberry, and Acacia tortillus, which is another one we know. And now oh, we've even got um, woolly caper bushes, uh, the most common little bushes that we're seeing around here. So we do know those ones from back home. And one of the exciting things is, is learning all the new trees. Now, there's a whole host of croton species. Um, there's about five different species of croton, and, which are, are common name is fever berries. And they are generally up around the edges or in any rocky areas or cliffs. Uh, that's where you're going to find the crotons. And, um, oh, there's just so, so many different trees to learn. And it is so wonderful. What are you spotted, Vim? Just looking at the trees. Now, almost all of those are Balanites, and, um, and of course, we're sitting in a great open plain, but why don't we go see what the open plains of Cheetah Plains have in, whole, uh, have in store for Tristan. Well, we're going to try and rival Brent. Not that it's going to be in any way possible, but we're heading to an open plain of ourselves. We're all the way on Cheetah Plains, and we're slowly but surely making our way to a little open section to try and see if we can't find the two elusive Cheetah Brothers. They've been a bit scarce of late, so I'm trying to see if they're not around this area. And then also just looking around for any sign of Inkanyeni and 
her cub Vitumi. I still yet to see Vitumi, so I really would like to see him. And other than that, it's just nice to be on Cheetah Plains. It's so pretty out here. The grass is that much longer than Juma. It's still got this green tinge to it, and it's such a beautiful property. I always find with Cheetah Plains, even if you don't see much here, it's just so nice to actually just spend time and sort of absorb the feeling and the change and the difference that it holds to Juma. So really good to be out here. And Seb and I have been discussing all things. We had a minor panic attack, I would say. What do you say? Seb, uh, minor... Yeah, a little bit of uh, concern. A little bit of concern because uh, Rusty decided to spew green liquid out of its bonnet, which was just a little bit of an overflow from the coolant. So nothing to worry about. All is okay. But for a second there, we thought we had broken Rusty again, which wouldn't, <laughs> we wouldn't have been very popular had we done that. I know Brent is sitting in the Mara and he is probably very concerned about how we're treating Rusty. Brent is very attached to Rusty and so I'm sure he's wondering if we're keeping her in good condition. But he will, I'm sure, form a bond with the new vehicles that we have up there. I have yet to actually to see the names of all of them. I know we've got a few new cars up there. It'll be interesting to see what names they get. I'm sure they'll get some very interesting ones. So far there's been very little sign of life on Cheetah Plains with heartbeats other than the trees and the grass and the butterflies which is normally around. There hasn't been too many antelopes or anything like that. I went and checked towards sort of Juma Dam side in the hope that there might be some elephants drinking there but alas there was none. So now I'm like I say going towards Cheetah Plains open and just checking around to see if there's anything up this way. I'm hoping also maybe there might be some giraffe on the open area. It's so beautiful when the giraffe are there at this time of the day with this afternoon light and those big open clearings. It really is very, very special. And I'm sure Brent will attest to that in the Masai Mara. It's one of the sort of beautiful parts about it is when you get those big journeys of giraffe going across those open areas. And it's something that we can all look forward to as we explore the Mara in the next few months and going forward in time. It really is going to be such a special thing and Seb and I were chatting about how amazing it's going to be to have the two of them together and with Juma it's going to be really really special to have those two sort of sections of the world brought together. So Chris in Amsterdam you're wondering if we ever see aardvarks during the day on safari. Well I haven't seen one during the day on safari. I've only ever actually seen three in this particular area that we're in and all of them have been at night, in, in fact quite late at night. I've only seen one during a game drive. The rest have been after game drives um, that I've seen them. But uh, it is possible and then in certain parts of um, Africa and in, in Botswana and parts of the Kalahari Desert I know aardvarks are seen quite regularly during the day. I haven't yet seen one. There are people that have I'm sure seen aardvarks here in um, the Sawi Sands during the day but it's not a very common sighting at all. We don't typically see them too often um, so it would be very 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 special if we did see one of those and in fact the last aardvark that I saw was dangling from a tree and Anderson the male leopard from the western sector had caught him and, and caught this uh, aardvark and put it up into this big marula tree and it was quite a sort of surreal experience driving down the road and there's an aardvark hanging from the tree. It was very very odd but they, leopards seem to really like them because I know Tingana has taken a few in his time and I think he's taken three or four. Um, Anderson I know of two different ones he's taken so they're obviously a bit susceptible to the leopards and that's maybe why we don't see too much of them. They, maybe their numbers are quite low from the leopard density that we do have in the Sabi Sands that could lead to the fact that these guys sort of numbers taper off a little bit and that they are very shy and reclusive and secretive. And I was very sad when Anderson killed that aardvark because it was an aardvark that was being seen more and more regularly. It used to live at a den or a termite mound very close to a hyena den on elephant plains and um, a few of the guys saw it in the space of about two three weeks it was seen I think four or five times by different varying different guides and it was starting to get quite relaxed with the vehicles and it was even to the point where we got vehicles to actually respond to the sighting which is quite strange and then Anderson came along and I'm pretty sure it's the same aardvark because it wasn't too far from that that termite mound that we found it in the in the marula tree so that was not a very good situation at all I was quite upset about that Now we are coming up towards 
buffalo pan and so there is a few sort of signal issues from time to time so I do apologize if there's a little bit of a breakup in picture it shouldn't last too long it's normally just one little section that we go through but it's a great pan to check because it's really in the far eastern corner it's tucked away um, it's often a one that holds things that nobody really checks so it's a great place to come and look now we're going to try and just get through this little tough signal area and while we do that let's go across to James who's still playing around with his spiders and hopefully will not get bitten this afternoon this one is not nearly as terrifying as the last one yesterday it was yesterday morning I think it was was it yesterday morning yes it was we found a bark spider that had built a nest or web over here because spiders, well, they can build nests, but normally they're webs. And it would have hit me clean in the face as I'd walked through here. And then in the afternoon, I came back here and I said, well, the bridge line must be over here somewhere and the spider must be here somewhere. And that was completely disastrous because we then didn't find anything. But I found the bridge line today and you probably won't be able to see it. But what I'm going to show you is its constructor. Now if you follow this grass along like this to this leaf over here you will see something that looks like a thorn and that everybody is a beautiful little bark spider. Mrs. Bark Spider she is shifting in the wind a bit I'll just try and hold her still is that better? Yep. Good. Isn't she fantastic? And that's where she sits for the whole day. All right, everybody, we are going to go off for a short break now. Of course, when you come back, I believe that Jamie may well have some elephants and perhaps there'll be some luck with those leopards. Hello everybody, obviously we didn't go to an advert break because we're just practicing for the television special which is of course on Saturday and Sunday, 3 to 5 o'clock Central African time, Nat Geo Wild. That's all I have to tell you. Good. And it's a celebration of Mother's Day, of course, which maybe this magnificent spider is. So what you will do now, either tomorrow morning or this evening, normally in the evening, but we found another one of these this, this morning, uh, building a web in the morning. She'll come scuttling out here. She'll sit in the middle there. And she will then let out strands, support strands, which will go down towards the bushes and then she will start to build the actual web and that'll stay like that until the morning then she'll come back in and she'll wait there for the whole night eat whatever flies into her web and then she'll eat up the silk during the course of the dawn leave her bridge line and scuttle off to live on one or other side of these gory bushes and what she did was she started there well, there she is. She's now going back across. She started the other side, and then when Fergus first put the camera on her, she scuttled out onto the web and moved across to this side. She's so cool. Now, I know it's probably a bit sort of shaky because of the wind blowing on her, but really I'm so impressed that we managed to find her, and I hope that we're not going to sort of disturb her web too much. Fergus and I certainly won't, being uh, roughly three foot five and three foot four each. And so as long as we keep the likes of Jandre away from here, we should be okay. And she should also be okay. The problem is we'll probably forget by tomorrow. Isn't that wonderful? I think that's great. Then, what I just want to show you, Brent was showing you and telling you about the rain. This is fairly odd and unseasonal cloud that we're having over here and I don't think there's any rain in the offing but unfortunately it does look like we're going to be having some cloud for our television show on Saturday which is not ideal of course but maybe the Mara will be sunny and that will be good. Now I think that Connor is looking at some water now apparently Yes, that is indeed twin dams, is it? Yes, it's treehouse dam, it's not twin dams. And that's where the buffalo were. You can actually see the buffalo there, I think, in the far end. The far western end of the dam there. Are they there? No. 
no buffalo, they've moved off. This is where we had a wonderful elephant sighting today. And some have said, and I mean, I think I'm in disagreement with some of my colleagues, who well, I just got a sh shiver because I've sat down on my chair, but I remembered that I'd replaced the chair. <laughs> um, some have said that they think that these dams are starting to get dry quickly and, you know, that it's going to be tough times again in the winter. I'm just not sure that that's true. I think they look pretty good at the moment. And I think the dams are much bigger than they were this time last year. Of course, they were expanded in expectation of the deluge that, uh, well, frankly, never came. And so it looks like they're holding much less water, I think, at this time last year. But I really don't think they are. And I think the animals are going to survive just fine through the winter. There's plenty to eat. There will hopefully be quite a lot to drink. And with any luck, we will not be having anything in the way of vast and unpleasant fires during the fire season of August, September and October. Well, anyway, up to the first rains, of course. And there's a gorgeous, gorgeous shot now. We're looking out east towards Mozambique, east over the great Kruger National Park and into Mozambique. And about 80 kilometres or 120 kilometres or so away is the vast Indian Ocean. And I don't think Connor is able to fly his drone all the way to the Indian Ocean, which is very sad. Now we're going back to TV. Shh, shh, shh. Hello everybody, welcome back to your live safari. We are having the most wonderful time out here and I hope that your mothers are as well. Hashtag Safari Live is how you get hold of us and my name is James Hendry. I've now got nothing else to tell you because I've run out of things to show you. Okay, I'll try and find something. <laughs> In the meantime, let's head across to Tristan, who I think is probably closer to this wind that I am on Cheetah Plains. Well, James, Cheetah Plains is looking spectacular. It is not quite the Masai Mara, but it is still so beautiful out here, and I really love spending time on Cheetah Plains. So we are going so slow just to check everything and see what's going on. Unfortunately, there was nothing at Buff Pan. I'm yet to find something very interesting there in my afternoon jaunts to Buffalo Pan. I keep hoping that I'm gonna bump into something rare that comes out of the Kruger, like a caracal or a serval or something like that. But alas, not yet. And I'm sure one day it'll happen, just got to keep trying. Now, as you can see, we've come out onto the plains area and I just always go slowly because the grass here is at that length that if the Cheetah Brothers are here and they're lying down flat, it's going to be almost impossible to see them. It's a very sort of long grass and you've got to go a little slower just to make sure that you scan everywhere and check and don't miss anything. The one sort of positive sign that there might have been some sort of disturbance is that there are no other animals out here that I can see. Normally when you come onto Cheetah Plains you'll find Normanus Norman the Gnu which is Brent's favorite wildebeest and he's normally around and there's often some impalas that will be around and every now and then some zebras so when you don't see any of them around then sometimes it can mean that there's been a little bit of a disturbance and so maybe just maybe our cheetah brothers have come through here although I think I see old Gnormanus Norman and the Gnu in the distance over there which we'll go a little bit closer to shortly Now, unfortunately, now that I'm on Cheetah Plains and I really wanted the afternoon light, the sun has gone behind a big cloud and it's become quite dreary now. It's not as impressive as I wanted it to be. The sun is misbehaving, or the clouds are misbehaving. Which one is it? Sun or clouds? I'd say clouds are misbehaving, Seb. So hopefully they will move off quite quickly and then we'll be graced with that beautiful golden light across the plains areas. Hmm, but so far not very much, not even any birds to speak of. And it's amazing actually coming to Cheetah Plains and seeing, well not hearing the monotonous larks, it almost became synonymous with that, this area. You would drive on here and you would just hear the monotonous larks calling. And so for those of you that are new viewers and are not sure about what the monotonous larks are, they're a little bird that flocked here during our summer this year and they don't keep quiet for one second of the day. They just call and call and call and call and call. And when you came onto Cheetah Plains, there was just this cacophony of bird calls sort of blowing out over the, over the open area. And so it's sort of quite strange to come through here now and it's eerily quiet now that we're going into winter. 
Ah, so the Elephant Whisperer is back in action again. She's out and about and has managed to find the namesake that she has. So let's go across to Jamie and see what she's doing with the elephants. I did do a lot of whispering to elephants yesterday, but that was more a product of the fact that they were very close and I didn't want to raise my voice at them. So there you go. There's an elephant, everybody. Definitely the best view of an elephant we've ever had. So we've had lions in Kenya with Brent, which is so very exciting. Now we've got another very large member of the animals that we see out here. James's elephant sighting this morning. Did he have a bull with quite long, thin, straight tusks by any chance? A bull with not an attitude problem, but just the temptation to try and sort of give a head shake at the vehicle? Because I'm pretty sure this is him. I know you can't tell from his tail end. I would be very impressed. I would be unbelievably impressed if you could tell if it was the same elephant by the view of his bottom and his tail. But if I try and get you a view of his tusks, perhaps you'll be able to tell me, because I think it's him. I know that they mentioned this morning on the Sunrise Safari that James's young bull gave him a bit of a head shake. I think it's him. Apparently, the elephant that James had had a tiny wound on the top of his trunk. Is this you, boy? His tusks look like female tusks. No, 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 nonsense. No, 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 nonsense. Yes, my boy. I can't see the top of his trunk. I wonder if it's the same elephant. He's... I'm giving him lots of distance just because when he walked past us, despite the fact that he had plenty of room, he still kind of thought about coming to give us a bit of a head shake and try and intimidate us. And behavior is very different when you deal with bull elephants, especially of this age. There we go. James and Final Control have confirmed it is, in fact, the same elephant. So from the Sunrise Safari this morning, this particular bull has walked from Treehouse Dam all the way to the north eastern corner of Juma. We're right up close to Buffelshook Dam. And now there he goes off into Buffel's Hook. That's interesting. That's nothing for a, a bull elephant. When you've got such long legs, they cover enormous distances. But it's just something nice, a sort of a follow-on from the Sunrise Safari. The fact that he has covered that distance, probably walking behind the herd of elephants that I've been tracking that have gone across into Buffel's Hook. Hey, boy. Well, there we go. That's very obliging of you. Yes, you stay there. You stop there. Don't you go disappearing just yet. You're the first animal I've seen. Not quite the first animal. I saw one in parlor. But close enough. Now, don't you disappear anyway. Tristan's absolutely right. It's quiet this side. But that's okay. The quiet afternoons make the exciting afternoons feel even more exciting. You missed a bit there, mister. There's still, he's quite a young elephant. I wouldn't put him much, I wouldn't put him much over 20. A young elephant out on his own, and often you find, especially when they're young like this, and on their own, they tend to be a bit more nervous, which is might, might just be why he's been giving me a bit of cheek earlier. Perhaps just not so used to being out all on his own. And the memory of being in a herd is still relatively fresh in his mind. Look at the way he's using his trunk, giving the blades of grass a few whips before putting it in his mouth, just to get rid of all of the dirt that he might have gathered. I can't believe how this place is still flourishing at this time of the year. Yes, the grass is going a little bit brown, but the rains, that the late rains that we've had, have turned them... A much well, I've noticed even some of the grasses have started to seed again. The panicum grasses, the buffalo grass, have got ripe seeds once again. That's actually really lovely. And there we go, James. You were wondering if the recent rains have prevented the grasses from drying out. Yes. I mean, look, they're going to go 
they're going to die off. That That is very typical. I'm surprised because I would have thought that by February, March, we would have come to pretty much the end of the summer rainfall growth season. But all of the grasses have revived. I've seen really nice looking red grass, which is one of the best quality grasses that we get out here, panicum grass, and the animals must be loving it because it just gives them that little bit of extra feeding time before we go into our dry season. So for elephants, the buffalo, the grazers, it is very special to see them still with fresh green grass at this time of year. Where, what are we? We're in the middle of May now. It's a good sign because when we do go into our dry season, we go in with an advantage. Our elephant is gone, I'm afraid. He is now on Buffle's hook, but that's okay. We've got a water hole to go and check. Let's go find out what's happening at Buffle's hook dam. We might get lucky. There might be a surprise herd of elephants drinking there. Or perhaps the new Buffles, what feels like a Buffles hook pod now. The five hippopotamus there yesterday. I'm going to go and check Buffles hook dam for something exciting. But it sounds as though Brent doesn't have to go very far to find exciting things. Let's go and see what's happening on the Mara now. Look at that incredible cloud bank and it looks like most of that rain is going to be pushing through to the west towards Lake Victoria. We're still playing the patience game with the Angama Pride. We can still only see a single lioness. The rest of them are lying in the long grass and she's fast asleep on top of a termitaria. She got a little visit from a cub for about a split second before the cub went off. And uh, well, I know I'm live, but it seems like I've lost comms with final control. Oh, we're heads up. And uh, hopefully this could be the beginning of the move, of the hunt. Now, we can't really see in the long grass, but there are lots of animals around us at the moment. And lots of warthog. And at this time of the day, they're going to be heading back towards their burrows. She could just be getting up to check where the little cubbies are. And oh, she spotted something. Where are my binoculars? There they are. And she is looking up towards the river. Can you hear? Yes, sorry that everybody. I was uh, off trying to see if I could find uh, or something that was making the squirrels alarm on the road there. I wasn't expecting to be linked to quite so fast. And now I'm breathlessly walking back through the bushes. Whew. Must apologize, but still there's much alarm calling going on. Every afternoon, like I say, there has been some kind of consternation thrown up by the birds. I don't suppose you can come this far, can you, Ferg? There's some dwarf mongoose here. I think they might pop out onto this log. Let's just watch this area here. They came running in here and they were making their alarm calls. Let's just watch the log there. Let's try the hornbills that were following the dwarf mongoose. Come over here, Fergus. We weren't quite prepared for this segment, I'm afraid. Well, I can hear them, but I think they're probably about seven kilometers away. Uh... <laughs> no, okay, you got one. Oh yes, flying. Not very close to the tent. Perhaps 
perhaps not our very best hornbill sighting that we've ever had from the tent. Good, right, okay. All right, now I believe Jamie is at Bivol's Hook Dam. I'm going to continue my search around here and I will catch up with you shortly. Ooh. I'm indeed at Bivol's Hook. Let us see what's happening here. One, two, three, hippopotamus. I think there's a fourth, judging by the ripples in the water. Oof. Got a bit of a snort. So there were five here yesterday afternoon. Now down to three or four. There we go, definitely four. Five hippopotamus. <laughs> I thought there were too many ripples, but just three. They're all five once again at Buffalo Zuga Dam. And obviously one of them making that very characteristic hippo sound that sounds as though one of them has just told the best joke in the entire world and they're having a jolly good laugh about it. <laughs> it's a sound I miss. You don't hear it all that often anymore. There's no hippo in Voyatella Dam outside of our camp where we live. But it's a sound that I've always heard everywhere that I've lived and worked in the bush. I've always had hippo calling close by. And one of them, and I think it's the one on the left there, or in the middle of the group, that one over there, yes, he's the one that's making all the noise. One of them's got a few scratches and injuries on, in, on its back. Could, most likely, from a skirmish with another hippo, it could also be from, potentially from a lion attack, Lions do attack hippopotamus, but they're le far less inclined to do that now this year, now that the drought is over and there's plenty of food and the hippo in good condition once again. Oh, Christina, you want to know if the hippos mind cold water. I don't think they do very well in Arctic temperatures, but other than that, no, the cold water doesn't bother them. Um, and of course, water bodies retain heat probably better than outside of the water. So I'm not sure how cold this water actually is, especially on days like today when the sun's been beating down on it all day from morning right up until now. But these sorts of temperatures, I would guess and say this water is probably somewhere in the low 20s centigrade, so in the low 70s Fahrenheit. I don't think it's that cold. Either way, hippopotamus are far more geared towards being prepared for the cold than they are for the heat, which is why they spend time in the water, to protect their skin, sensitive skin from the sun. I don't think they're too bothered by it. They've got such fatty, fatty tissue, a really thick skin and a very thick layer of fat, and plenty of fat in the, in the muscle tissues as well. And I think you'll probably find that that insulates them just fine. They're not geared towards living in cold temperatures. Really cold temperatures, not our South African low felt temperatures. And you won't really find a hippopotamus in a high felt dam where it does get much colder. There's a creature out here a little bit to the right of the hippopotamus and yes, I did mistake one for a hippo the, yesterday afternoon. In my defense, there is no defense, but in my defense, the sun was shining straight into my eyes. But either way, there's some terrapins who have escaped the chill of the water to enjoy some last minute basking in the sun before it goes down and it gets cold and they return to the water once again. So as reptiles, of course, they are ectotherms which means that a lot of their body control comes from external temperatures or body temperature control comes from external factors. They have to go and bask in the sun to heat up, which is why you often see them sitting on hippopotamus, like little mobile islands. Here we go, all enjoying the sun, They're not bothered by the idea of having to settle in the water. Now, Kirk, just moving back to our hippopotamus. Hello, hippopotamus. You want to know what does the hippo do when it goes underneath the surface of the water? 
I suppose it depends on the situation. The first thing that'll happen is it'll close its nostrils and its ears, something that we were chatting about yesterday afternoon on the Sunset Safari. As soon as it goes under, there you go, you can see its nostrils closing up and its ears will tuck inwards so that the water doesn't go into the sensitive ear canal and get stuck there and give them a swimmer's ear. They can sink to the bottom and rest there and they can hold their breath for up to five, six minutes at a time. I've seen a hippo hold its breath for up to ten minutes, but not much longer than that. And because they can't swim, then they'll run along, if they need to get somewhere, then they'll walk or they'll run along the bottom of the water and then propel themselves upwards every time they need to take a breath. I, but other than that, I mean, the water's so dark and murky, I don't know, they could be, they could be having a party down there. They could be juggling, they could be doing karaoke, they could be, what else could they be doing that's relatively whimsical? Playing cards, playing poker. Perhaps this is a very um, riveting game of poker and they are sorry that they have to interrupt it every time they come to the surface of the water. That one's losing. That one got a bad hand. No, I'm joking, of course. Most of the time they will during days like today they'll hang out in the shallows and they'll just rest a lot of the time they're actually sleeping and they'll be resting with their head at the surface of the water so they'll be able to breathe and they're even even capable of propelling themselves to the surface while they're basically half asleep in order to take a breath and then sink back down again and that of course is because they spend their nights they have very very busy nights as a hippopotamus they can walk easily 10 kilometers possibly even more during one night searching for grass to feed on so they go off grazing in the evenings and they always look so innocuous and unthreatening in the water but they're not they're absolutely massive creatures very powerful and very dangerous and we spoke about the wounds on that one hippopotamus Amy no a leopard would be the chances of a leopard attacking a hippopotamus are next to nothing. I don't want to say it's never happened because perhaps there's a situation where a young hippo calf got separated by the mother or the mother died during the labor process and maybe a big male leopard might take advantage of that. So it's possible that it's happened historically at some point, but it's very, very unlikely. A hippopotamus weighs up to two tons. That's over 4,000 pounds. A big male leopard maybe tops the scales at 90, maybe a little bit larger than that. So under 200 pounds either way. There's no way they have the strength to attack a hippopotamus. And the only reason that lions dare to do it is because they, have, they work together as a team. They're social hunters. And having numbers really does help in that situation. But no, the hippopotamus at being attacked by a leopard is basically impossible. It's highly, highly unlikely. A hippopotamus being attacked by a hyena, a clan of hyenas, that has happened. And that we've actually seen before. Shame, that poor baby hippo again. Situation where it was a baby and mum was... We don't know what happened to mum. We don't think that she made it. Uh, it was the, during the time of the drought and there was a young hippo at Arethusa Dam. And unfortunately, the hyenas got it. But again, a situation where you've got a social hunter working together to take down a big animal. And there's nothing much happening at the water's edge, but I don't know, perhaps Ronald has had more luck. Ronald was having more luck. Unfortunately, his waterbuck friends have gone away. He's still got his uh, terrapin friend there, who's looking a little bit suspicious because I've managed to sneak quite a lot closer towards the terrapin. But unfortunately, the waterbuck have now moved. Do we have control of the dam cam? Oh, but we do have picture, I see, of the waterbuck. Good, well done, Zumi. Brilliant stuff. There they are. A herd of waterbuck, a blacksmith lapwing, and it all looks rather peaceful as the sun begins to set on yet another magnificent African day here in the greater Kruger National Park of South Africa. It is not something lurking. No, it's not. Never mind.
Hello, Norwegian Furnace. How very nice to hear from you. I don't think I've heard from somebody called Norwegian Furnace before. I had a wonderful book when I was a small child. And as you ask there, what is the fastest antelope? I'll tell you what I read in that book, and I think it's probably true. There are the white-faced whistling ducks. You can see them as well. Um, they are not the fastest antelope. They're not antelopes, really. They're duck. The fastest antelope, apparently, is probably a sesame. And a sesame is supposed to be a very fast antelope and very closely related subspecies of what Brent's been showing you, the topi. And so the topi are probably amongst the fastest antelope that there are. Of course, measuring the speed is not easy because you can't make them run in a straight line and you don't know if they're running flat out, if they're going full speed or not. So it's really quite difficult to figure out exactly who the fastest is, but a sesame is supposed to be quite fast. Uh, I think it would probably run at around about 50 miles an hour. They can probably hit almost 80 kilometers an hour at, at, at a real push, so they're quite quick. That's what I've read. Who's worked that out and how they've worked it out, I couldn't begin to tell you, I'm afraid. Good. Well, I'm afraid the, uh, the water buck don't seem to be hanging around for too long, but I'd have found you something with a wonderful name. And the name, I'm going to just say before I look at it, it is uh, Bractipus rotundifrons. Bractipus rotundifrons. Say that a few times. Bractipus rotundifrons. Fergus? Bractipus rotundifrons. Rotundi there we go. Well done. Good. Bractipus rotundifrons is in here. And this particular thing called... Oh, hang on. We're going to head across to Tristan quickly. We have a awesome sighting of this hornbill. It is trying to swallow a massive grasshopper. It's almost down now, but it's been wrestling with it, trying to get it into the right position. And you can see the wings are not going down, so I wonder if it's not going to regurgitate it again a little bit. Let's see. It's bitten off a bit more than you can chew there, little hornbill. There's a bit of the legs coming out, so for those who are a little bit sensitive, I do apologize. It unfortunately was the end of that locust. But there we go. Most of it's down now just shows you how big a meal these hornbills can get. When that locust was out, it was about almost the size of the beak. So absolutely amazing to watch how they manipulate it and use that big beak to kind of crush everything down and break that exoskeleton up to then be able to swallow it. Amazing to watch. And the fact that it stayed, we've, it's very, very close to us. I thought it was going to fly away and Seb and I were a bit worried, but it seems like he's quite happy just to sit and finish his meal before carrying on. Now there was another one with it who I think was hoping it would pick up some scraps but it flew off when we arrived. There we go, well done. That was a good meal. Looking very proud of itself isn't it Seb? Yeah. Now it's looking for more as only a hornbill could do. They are so gluttonous these little creatures. Now we're going to do a bit of beak maintenance, get rid of any bit of grasshopper that may be on the beak and then I would imagine to hop off and then probably oh, we found some more. There we go. No, that was just a twig. You can see how it's cocking its head a little bit to be able to look and see if there's any other little bits of this grasshopper that could be around. I'm afraid you ate it all, you silly bird. They are such comical little birds there. They've got such a way about them. I really, really enjoy hornbills and watching them go about their day. They seem to always be up to something and getting themselves into trouble. Now let's just see. It's gone up onto a branch and it's busy just grooming itself now. I want to try and see if we can't get up alongside it. It might be quite nice with the backlight there, Seb. I don't know if you've got it. Can you see it there? It's just in front. I'm just going to try to see if we can't find it. I'm worried it might fly away, but there we go. So after a good meal, it's always good to get oneself into good condition again. So it's like after you've eaten some fried chicken or something like that, and you've got to now go and clean your hands. It's the exact same with this hornbill. It's now eaten its locusts and is getting rid of all those little bits and keeping the beak in good condition. Well done. Great table manners from this bird this afternoon. There we go. Isn't this cool? Now, so often we get to see the... Oh, there it is. So, oh, Laura Moore, you're saying, do they eat button spiders like the ones that James found under his seat? Well, I would imagine they would. I've never actually seen one eating one. Hornbills seem to go after everything. So I wouldn't be surprised if they could find a brown button spider that they would eat them. But it's... A
That's, I've never seen one, so I can't say with 100% certainty. Maybe James will know, or Jamie might have seen the one doing it, but I certainly have never seen them eating a brown button spider specifically. Um, I've seen them eating solifuge, so um, like Jamie had on a bushwalk this morning, she found a dead solifuge, which is not exactly a spider, but it is kind of related to the arachnids. Um, I've seen them eating scorpions, so I wouldn't be surprised if they have eaten brown button spiders, but I've never in my experience actually seen one eating a brown button spider, but you never know. I can't tell you how beautiful it is where we're driving now. You can just see in the sort of top part here, there's these afternoon rays of light coming down and we're on Chitwa Chitwa at the moment and there's this sort of avenue of grasses with trees and the light is just sort of filtering through and it is such a beautiful scene. Now all I need is Tundi and Tumba to come strolling down the road towards us. What do you think, Seb? Seb reckons that would complete the image, but it really is pretty just driving around here and just having these sort of late afternoon light kind of coming through the trees. So, so. Right, so now that our hornbill has finished its meal and we're back on our way again, let's go back across to James and see if he can finish his drawing. Beautiful leopard coming down the road, Tamba and Tandi, it would be wonderful. I was pretending to be Sebastian. Where? Where? Good. Sebastian, I don't know if you've ever heard him speak, he has the most magnificent French accent you've ever heard, and it is almost impossible to talk to him without uh, sort of trying to emulate it. In fact, uh, he was trying to have a serious conversation with Kirsten earlier today, and she kept looking at him going, Sacre bleu! Sacre bleu! And uh, I think he left in, in high dudgeon eventually. Who can blame the man? Anyway, we were talking about uh, uh, Bracteo... What was it called again? Bracteopus rotundifrons. Now this example of Bracteotus, Bracteopus rotundifrons unfortunately has lost a leg. Sorry. You know what, let's just give up on that and do it with a microscope. Poor old little Bracteopus. And I found him on the desk here. He'd obviously hopped in and you can see that the main portion of his locomotion is now missing. Now, these are part of the theraclid grasshoppers. Now, we've seen all three spe kinds of theraclids. There is Theracles himself, there is Pseudotheracles, and now there is Bracteopus rotundifrons. And that light shining on him is the sun that he's now walking towards, and I promise you I will release him. I know he looks like he's struggling. It is because it's very slippery there. I mean, he's not long for this world with only one leg, uh, but perhaps he'll survive. Isn't he beautiful? And he's about, ooh, about, what, a centimetre long? So about half an inch, just under half an inch. Very sweet. Reach for the light, little man, reach for the light. Mary, um, you'll find it's not only the insect world. I've seen it happen in humanity. You say, how is it common, or why is it common in the insect world that females eat males? I am, of course, now being extremely facetious. Uh, it is common, Mary, because males, frankly, serve no purpose. And in much the same way that, uh, you know, you could, you've heard, of, obviously, of useless fathers in the human and mammal worlds, where the male is little more than a sperm donor, well, in the case of the insects, that is absolutely the case. They play no role in child-rearing whatsoever. And so they, far from being a useful sort of parenting uh, help, they are far more useful as supper. So once you've mated with a male who's going to pay absolutely no attention to the children, not going to provide any kind of usefulness at all, well, you may as well eat him because he's not serving any other purpose. And so I think that's why it happens. I mean, it hasn't evolved in mammals, to the best of my knowledge, it doesn't happen in mammals. Well, obviously it doesn't amongst the herbivores. But in the carnivores, although we've lamented the uh, parenting or fathering skills of many of our male leopards, Tingana especially, um, they do serve a purpose. Tingana is actually being the perfect father for leopards. As a human father, he'd be absolutely appalling. He'd be arrested and thrown in jail. But as a leopard father, 
he's providing the service and the function that he was evolved to do, and that is to protect the the territory in which his babies live from uh, other males that might come in and hurt them. So. In the insect world, obviously that isn't the case. So once, uh, whether a that mantis, for example, that f a female, a male mantis like that, serves absolutely no purpose whatsoever, except as a food source. Once he has donated his sperm, so that's why I think, I think that's a really nice question actually. Right, let us take Bracteopus outside and try and put him in a place that is salubrious, comfortable for him in his uh, well, possibly last hours. I'm not sure why he ended up in the tent. Now, we're going to just quickly put him in here, in amongst the grass, because as a grasshopper, of course, where else would you want to live, Fergus, but in the grass? Can you see him? Mm-hmm. There he goes. Goodbye, Bracteopus rotundi fronds. It's been real. Now, Bracteopus rotundi fronds is not possessed of wings, but Connor is. There we are. You can see Connor is now looking at the sunset. <laughs> and that is an absolutely gorgeous picture. Isn't that wonderful? Connor, you're outdoing yourself. You're being outlandishly artistic for an engineer. Gosh, that is just fantastic. Where is he? I must try and find that position myself. I mean, obviously not on... In 40s, oh, he's by the Gari Repeater. Ah, yes. Now, of course, you can get that view if you climb up the Gari Repeater, which I would not recommend doing. It's uh, quite scary. But that is the sun sinking in the western horizon, and it's that colour, of course, because as things start to dry out, so the dust starts to come up into the air with the winds that come off the mountain top. There is the Gari Repeater. You see that tower there on the left hand side of your screen? Well, that's where the signal is going. So, in fact, it's quite interesting. The signal is going from the drone down into Jigger, which is what Connor's driving, and from Jigger into that tower, from that tower to the main tower above the final control or near the final control, and then out to you. And all of that happens in the blink of an eye. Oh, my goodness, look at this. This is just too spectacular. There you can see the mountains of the northern Drakensberg. <laughs> I just wish we had some sound there, what it must sound like up there. But of course, well, yeah, if you, up there it sounds like a swarm of angry bees at the moment, but can you imagine how silent it must be if you're a vulture flying past, thinking about a place to land for the night? And in the lee of those hills, of course, is Hood, is Hood Sprite. And as you head towards the left, all the settlements of Bushbuck Ridge, Hazy View, and eventually White River. Yeah, Christina, what a great way of putting it. You say, liquid gold sky. I don't know if you've ever tried to take a photograph like this and then sort of pick out the colours, but it's there are so many colours there. There are probably, if you know, if you broke it down completely, there'd be thousands of colours there. And no two spots in this picture are the same colour. And I think that's what makes it so astounding. And perhaps that's what makes artists so impressive, or some artists so impressive, that they're able to recreate that impression with their paintbrushes rather than with a photograph or a video. Gee, that is just something special. Connor's now swinging towards the north. You can just see the tip of the guy repeater there. And it's not quite that dark yet. The, I mean, it's actually very bright outside, but he's exposing for the sky. And so that means that the ground will be much darker. And what's so cool about that, I think, is that it shows how amazingly impressive the human eye is. There is not a camera lens, as far as I'm aware, that is able to do what the human eye can do. And if you were looking at that, if you were looking at that picture over there, what you would see is you would, your eye would be able to expose, or your brain's basically doing it for you, but you would be able to expose for that 
sun and it would look like that to you but below that you would be able to see the light being cast on the ground as well and there is absolutely no way that any camera can do that which I think is quite fantastic it just goes to show how very very clever we are now Jamie well I'm gonna let her tell you about it well the search for the spotted hyena begins in the last hour or so of our sunset safari. Which den site are they using? And I've been having a bit of a nostalgic moment again. I seem to have a few of those, or seem to be having a few of those over the last few days. Sitting here at the Mvubu Road hyena den and having a look to see whether or not there's any sign of them. The grass growing out of the entrance hole is a relatively dead giveaway that there's nobody here, but I'm going to jump out anyway, just in case, rather than jump to any conclusions. I'm just gonna have a quick circle around here and just see if there's any hyena tracks. I have to be honest, I think that the northern dens, or checking the northern dens is barking up the wrong tree, or whooping up the wrong tree, I guess, in the case of hyenas. I don't think they're here. There doesn't appear to be any sign of them. Always got to be careful, though. Oh, it's smelly. Very smelly. And somebody's been digging here. You don't want to encounter a warthog that comes running out of a den site either, though. Something's been digging here, but it's not. Uh, we're losing audio. Oh, sorry, Craig. Let me come back. Apparently my sound was disappearing. I don't think it's hyenas. I think it's warthog. And the only tracks around here are impala tracks. Fresh impala midden. No freshly chewed sticks by teething hyena cubs. I don't think they're in any of the northern dens. So not Gallego. Check Gallego regularly, they're definitely not there. This morning I checked Aubrey's for tracks, there were no tracks there. I've checked Zoe's for tracks, there are no tracks there. This morning we walked very far, indeed. But there's no sign of any of those den sites being active. And I'm, Tristan and I had a discussion about it earlier. We're on the same page. I don't believe that they're to the north. I think they're still around the Philemon's Cutline den, just in any one of those, there's so many termite mounds in that area where they could have decided to be. I've just been working on the hope that they go to an old den site. Oh, sorry, Curse, I didn't fully hear. Did you say where will the hyenas move their dens or? Why? There we go. So. We have a question about why hyenas will move their den sites, and that comes from Amanda. Amanda, the reason that they do that, I'm not too worried about driving in here because there's no hyenas. The reason that they do that is because when you have a den site, when you have animals living in a place, particularly animals that, let's face it, don't have the greatest sense of personal hygiene, well, parasites build up, the scent builds up, and that can attract negative attention. Lions, particularly lions, will go after hyena cubs and they don't want that to happen. It's also a build-up of parasites. It's unhygienic even for something as tough as a hyena cub. So they move them on a relatively regular basis and especially when they start to bring meat back to the den site, when they bring carcasses back to the den site, you might find that they move more frequently. Wild dogs do the same thing. So when wild dogs have their pups in a den site, also usually in this area, a termite mound, they'll also move them again. Uh, after a couple of weeks or a couple of months, they'll usually, in the beginning, they'll try and keep the cubs in one place because they're young and moving them is dangerous and slow. But once they get older, then they can move them. Ah, thorns are coming to get me. They can move them more regularly. The problem with that being, of course, then we have to go and find them again. Now, while we head to the next den, it seems as though Ronald shall be lonely no more. Ronald is lonely no more. No, let's have a look. There he is. Now, he has got there two terrapins, two serrated hinge terrapins, and two ducks. In fact, quite possibly the entire family of ducks. Now, 
I'm quite keen to just see if I can't swing Ronald very slightly to the right-hand side. Now, before I do that, I must warn you that what could happen is that the terrapins might rush into the water. That doesn't worry me too much. Ooh, hang on a second. Before we do that, I must tell you that with these terrapins, the male is smaller than the female, and I wonder if we're not seeing some courtship here. What do you think, Fergus? Do you think we're seeing some some courtship? They look quite amorous, don't they? Hang on a second. Let's see if we can help them along a little bit. Shall we? Let's see if we can create a bit of atmosphere for them. I think we probably can. Stand by one second. Set the fire. Set the fire. Here we go. Beautiful. Okay, guys. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Yeah. Ah. That's it. Smooth sounds of saxophone in the evening. Time is now, The time is now to make a move. The sun is set. Can you imagine a more romantic scene than this? Don't be afraid. You gotta take a chance, man. I know it's difficult with a duck looking on, but the duck don't care. You're a terrapin. Terrapins ain't scared of ducks. In fact, they eat small ducks. <laughs> yeah, that's ridiculous. <laughs> it's totally ended. And now they're not, they don't seem to be interested anymore. Oh well. Um, I, I think I'm, I was going to move the rover to see if we could get a better picture of the ducks, but I think that will it could disturb them, and I think in this... Well, I mean, they're in a slightly sensitive position, aren't they? So let's just leave them be. I think this is just wonderful. John, I don't know the answer to this, and I think it's a very good question, because I've looked at it and wondered, and I've tried to find an answer in a book, actually, and I, I don't know. You say, why do they hold their heads towards the sky? I'm going to guess, John, and my guess is that by ho they, by sticking their necks out like that, they expose more skin to the atmosphere, and that then would allow them perhaps to absorb more heat, because the skin is obviously going to be a lot less well insulated than the shell. So I think that's what it is. It's probably to expose as much skin as possible to the elements. Come on, duck, just take two steps forward. I would really seriously love to move Ronald, but I think you might fly off. I'm not sure how brave you are. Uh, that duck is a terrible voyeur. It is. Fergus has just said, I don't know if you heard him there, he said, the duck is a terrible voyeur. He is a dreadful voyeur. He's pretending he's not there. You see that? I mean, he's standing completely, completely still, fascinated by what's going on there with the terrapins. One of whom, the male, seems to be flapping his fins on the female in order to enthuse her. Light a candle, man. Don't flap at her with your fins. He's now sort of looking sheepish and blowing his throat out slightly. Ah, <laughs> oh, this is wonderful. Now, you know, this... Ronald is basically doing what I would, if I came on safari these days, I would be very tempted, especially in the winter, to, once I'd finished my morning game drive, to take a picnic breakfast, including lunch and possibly a fine G&T, and I would sit in the shade next to a waterhole for the whole day with a good book in one place. And if you do that, stuff will happen. Ronald has been sat here for well, nigh on three hours now, and he's just had the most wonderful sightings. He's had the waterbuck, 
They came past him. He's probably had a few views of the water monitor lizard. He's had these terrapins up and down onto the bank, and now he's got the ducks. So if you sit next to water for long enough, apart from the wonderful sense of peace that water gives you in the wild, you're bound to see interesting things happening. I think that was fantastic, and I do apologize for my... Um, Slightly odd sense of humour. Let's head across to Tristan, who is at some more water. We are indeed. We're at probably one of the most picturesque settings that I've seen in quite a long time. We're at Chitwa Dam, and as that sun is setting, the clouds are just illuminating this beautiful pink colour, and the water is reflecting the clouds. It really is very, very pretty indeed. The only problem is, is we can't see any of our hippos or crocodiles and Seb and I got very excited because there was a little stick that was floating on the surface of the water and it looked just like a baby crocodile and I thought maybe there was little babies around and that would have been so incredible but alas it was just a stick floating so Seb and I got a bit excited for nothing but isn't that beautiful? Such an incredible place just to spend the afternoon at this time of the day. You can often just sit and listen to all the sounds and sometimes you'll hear the hippos calling. There are some impalas and waterbuck on the other side of the dam in that area that are just busy grazing. They came down for a little drink earlier on. And then we've got some fish eagles around as well, which we'll try and show you just now. They're a little bit further afield. But there's the waterbuck and the impalas having a nice sort of stroll in the open area. And this is a perfect place for these prey animals to spend the evening they know that this is very very open and so it's going to be very difficult for any predator to sneak up on them and so they can really kind of spend the time feeding and there's multiple different species that are in amongst them there and that's because of this open area see there's a nyala that's busy bounding up as well don't know if you can see it there see if it's a, oh, there it is there it is coming into frame a male nyala in the background so he's also joined the fray so three different species in one shot there we go very, very pretty, and that's why coming to dams at this time of the day is such a sort of special thing to do. Not only is the scenery beautiful, but you often get these multiple different species that are coming together in open sections and then around the water itself. So it really is so nice just to be sitting here, and I can see the clouds are starting to get that really pink coloration. The sun has just gone behind the Drakensberg Mountains, and if you have a look now to our left a little bit, there we go, look at that pink coloration that's coming through. Isn't that spectacular? Absolutely marvellous, and since it is marvellous May, marvellous is probably the best way to describe that lovely sunset that we are having. You can see the colours in the clouds. Very nice. And I'm very glad that the rain clouds that we saw earlier, the stormy clouds that we had on the horizon, have all blown away, and that we've had a nice dry afternoon. I wasn't really in the mood for a thunderstorm and getting very wet. Oh, did the fish eagle just catch something? Do you see that, Seb? I know, I was on the cloud. So it's busy flying there away. I don't know if you can see it to the right of the nest. There it goes. I don't know if it caught something. I just saw it splashing in the water. Yes, look, it's got something in its talons. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? So it seems like it's caught a fish, and it's obviously managed to get a small one. There we go, look at that. So it's busy feeding now. So it must have gotten a little bream. So we get these kind of fish in this area called bream, or they're also known as tilapia in South Africa. And so the fish eagle is just sitting on the edge, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw it coming down and heard a splash, and it's now taken off, and it's got that bream in its talons. I wonder if we can't, unfortunately we can't get any closer than what we are now. But isn't that incredible? You can see the male waterbuck is busy chasing females around. He's feeling rather feisty. Hippos grunting in the background, nyalas displaying. It's all happening. Isn't this amazing? It just shows you when you sit for a little bit and just watch what goes on, that lots and lots of things can happen. There's a little baby waterbuck now playing as well. Absolutely incredible. What a beautiful spot. That was an action-packed little minute there. I wonder why they're all running around. This, the Nyala came running down, there were some Impalas running. Maybe it's just because it's starting to get cool that they've got a bit of excess energy that they're burning and that's why they're chasing one another around. But that fish eagle was amazing. It would have been incredible if we had actually been on it. That would have been yeah, quite nice. Yeah. It's very, very difficult to get fish eagles. I almost did and then I thought I would get the sunset first. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sebastian is saying that he almost did, but he thought he would get the sunset first before it disappears because the light is starting to fade now and we're starting to lose that coloration. So he was just panning off <laughs> the fish eagle and it came down. And that's Murphy's Law. That's how it often goes out here, is that you get these situations where as you kind of move off things, so they do a little bit of action and 
you miss it, but it's okay. At least we still got to see it now up on the tree feeding. And like I say, I can't see exactly what type of fish it is, but it's a little bit small to be a catfish. Also, the shape of it didn't seem right. As it was sort of flying away, it looked more of a sort of rounded shape, which is what the tilapia looked like, whereas a catfish tends to be a lot more sort of slender in its shape with a very big bulky head. And this looked like it had quite a small head. But either way, that's a great meal for that fish eagle and not something you see every day. Really, really cool. You can see the impalas bounding away in the background as well. Maybe that's what's setting off our male waterbuck and making him a little bit feisty and chasing everybody around. Really, really nice. And it's amazing actually how quickly the color has faded from these clouds. They've become a lot more purple now. Sorry, Seb, I was just looking up as we were talking about them, but you can see the color now is a lot sort of more faded in terms of the blues and we're now getting a lot more of the pinks and purples coming through the yellows also fading out a little bit so it really is amazing how fast it changes here and how quickly that sun went down when we were coming towards Chipto Dam the sun was still up and by the time we came over this dam wall which is this road in front of us and we turned around it ended up already being behind the clouds and well behind the mountain should I say and below the sort of level of what we could see Sorry, I thought I heard something, but I was making it up. There was nothing behind me. So while we sit here and just enjoy the last little bit of sunlight, let's go across to Jamie and see where she is and if she's had any more luck with hyena dens and whether or not she will have more luck and if she's going to check any more of them. I'm still on my way. Oh, sorry. Attack of the fallen tree. I'm still on my way to check the Philemon's cut line den. We might as well check Philemon's cut line just in case they haven't moved. Oh dear. I've acquired a passenger. Out! Get out from under my wheels. Thank you. Let's stick in the road. That is the third time I've done that today. Twice in my own vehicle, and now on Wendy. Ridiculous. Okay. Well, that's a very pretty sky. Let's just stop for one second and take that in. I know you've been looking at it with a Tristan at Chitwa Dam, but still, different perspectives. Every cloud has a rosy lining, which is different to a silver one. Now, having the beautiful view of our African sunset, Royal Gem, you would like to know how long does it take for the sun to set in Africa? Roughly the same time it takes for the sun to set pretty much anywhere else, given the constant speed of the rotation of the Earth. Uh, I suppose, of course, it would very much depend upon where you are. Um, if I were on a crest, I would see the sun for longer than if I were down in a valley, because, of course, the mountains would, would block it out. Um, I'm trying to think how, how much scientific detail to go into here. Bear in mind, of course, that the uh, Africa is quite, quite a big continent, a very big continent, actually. So there, I guess there might be differences between the equator just in terms of the bulge of the earth. Can we just can we just say pretty much the same as it takes to set absolutely everywhere else? But thank you for sending through your question, Royal Gem. Very much appreciated. At least you believe us that the sun does set here. We once had a viewer that um, decided they'd caught us out on a morning safari because it, it had gone from dark to light and therefore was not live. We were all very confused by that. We came to the conclusion that perhaps that person wasn't fully aware of how mornings work, or perhaps just assumed that we didn't have them here in South Africa, but we do indeed have the sunrises and we have beautiful sunsets. <coughs> okay. How long does the sun take to set, actually? Time-wise, uh, this is a genuine question. I've never sat and timed it, but isn't it something like two and a half minutes from when the sun... The, 
Two minutes 48, says Craig, he thinks. That's very specific. Thank you, Craig. Two minutes 48 from when the, the bottom of the sun is on the horizon to when the top disappears past the horizon. So final control, next time you see us with a sunset, that's your time scale to link to us. <laughs> Google that. Okay, let me just take a deep breath. Google apparently tells us that it's up to you wherever you happen to be. I suppose it's up to you depending on when you've decided that the sunset has started. Uh, but around about 15 minutes is Google's answer. Thank you, Google. Much appreciated. So we've got 2 minutes and 48 seconds from when the bottom to the top disappearing. And we've got 15 minutes presumably of the most beautiful part of the sunset. Now, uh, personally, I don't think that's correct. I would say that an African sunset requires at least 32 minutes and 15 seconds, and at the same time also requires a comfy spot and a glass of apple juice as the sun disappears below the horizon. That is what I feel a South African sunset requires, but that's just me. As Google said, it's up to you. Okay, we nearly at the Philemon's cut line den. I am very grateful to live in a world where we can watch this, or at least live in a place where you can watch the sunset without it disappearing behind clouds or behind buildings or into smog pollution smog all right ribbon if you're sitting at the philemon's cut line den after the whole morning of searching for you I wouldn't be at all surprised. I don't see a single track on this road though. That's not a good sign. That's not a good sign at all. As we make our way in, don't forget to send through your suggestions for the naming of our two hyena cubs two little hyena cubs belonging to Ribbon that it seems as though just yesterday that we found them and they were all dark and wobbly and now are far more stable, far more playful, very spotty and have vanished. But send through, definitely send through your name suggestions, an iconic duo, something that just two names that you feel fit really well together. Halitosis and gum disease does not count. All right, no, these hyenas are not here. These hyenas are definitely not at this den site. There's not a single footprint. So where are they? Where have they gone? While I contemplate these deep and meaningful questions, let's go across to James for a deep and meaningful answer as to how long the sun takes to set in Africa. So deep and so meaningful shall I now be. Now, I've struggled to find much information, of course, on how long it takes the sun to set. I'm assuming what we mean by this is when the sun touches the horizon, how long until the orb actually disappears beneath the horizon. In this area, it probably takes around about two and a half minutes. Now that's because, and that will vary at different times of the year. So as far as I can work out, the closer it is above your head, so for us we're pretty much on the Tropic of Cancer. Is it Cancer down here or Capricorn? No? Is it Capricorn? You sure, are you? Yeah, very sure. Okay. Tropic of Capricorn down here. So the summer solstice, it'll be right above our heads. It would take the longest. So I imagine then it would take probably 
say up to three minutes to go down. Then in winter, when it's, is this right? Yes, in winter when it's much farther away and it's over the Tropic of Cancer, I suspect it would probably take maybe two and a half minutes to go. But that is also affected at as far as you know, it's affected by the latitude that you're at. So if you're in England, um, it's going to take apparently about four minutes to go down. And if you're in Kenya, where Brent is now, and especially as it does set in, it sets behind the mountain, so it'll probably take a little bit uh, e even shorter there. I suspect you're probably looking at about two minutes maybe in Kenya. And What's interesting here, of course, is that the question was, how long does it take to set in Africa? Well, Africa is obviously vast. Its southern tip is, I forget exactly what the latitude is, but it's roughly the same latitude, I think, as about Buenos Aires in South America. And then the northern part of Africa, the most northerly part of Africa, let's just call it uh, just off the coast of Morocco and the Rock, Rock of Gibraltar, somewhere around there. And it's not Africa, of course, but it's round about that latitude. So it's well south of Europe, and I suspect you'll find there it probably is in around about the two minute, uh, two and a half, probably the same as here, two and a half minutes or so, and Cape Town probably takes just slightly longer. In fact, I think it does. And, of course, the twilight, the higher your latitude, in other words, the closer you go to the poles, the longer the twilight will last. I've often had conversations with guests out here when we've been on safari, and they say when the sun goes down, it's like a light going out, whereas they have these long, extensive twilights where they come from in the summer. And many of you in the United States, of course, will experience that, and in Europe and the higher latitudes. But he here, and especially in Kenya, because Brent is pretty much sitting on the equator, so where that happens, as the sun goes down, it really is. It's like a light going out. It is light, and then 20 minutes later, it's completely dark. Here, we've probably got about half an hour or so of twilight before it goes dark. And in fact, we don't really even have a twilight. We have dusk, and then we have night. We don't have that sort of half light that you get at much higher latitudes. And that's all I have to say about that. Now, we are trying desperately to find some kind of small life living in these flowers. And the reason we're trying to do that, of course, is that it's getting too dark to go outside and find other interesting little things. So we're going to just examine the flowers and see if we can't find a few creatures. And unfortunately, the creatures for the last two times that I've, no, last two days, have been rather conspicuous by their absence in the flowers, unfortunately. And I can't see anything by way of thrip in here. Can you see any thrips there, Fergus? Our favorite, favorite insects. I can't see any thrips. But I'm going to make it my mission that before the end of this drive, because I know that next to viewing the lepers of the royal family, thrips are your favorite. I know all of you are desperately wanting to see a couple more thrips. And so I will make it my mission to find you some before the drive is out. This flower from the monkey pod, Senna petisiana, is free of thrips. Ooh. No, I don't think it's anything, I'm afraid. Whew. Take care. You used the word spider, and I really think that was very unkind of you in having known what I went through earlier today, but I'm just going to take a breath. I'm just going to quickly look under my chair. There is still some silk here, actually. Yep, we seem to be all right. Okay, good. Take care, you say, who teaches a spider to make a web? Well, the same person or same entity or same uh, biological... What am I going for here? Biological chemical. It's a chemical that teaches a cuckoo where to, where to migrate to. It's in the genetics. Uh, somehow that is, it has become encoded in the genetics, and they know how to build webs in the same way that a termite knows somehow where to go foraging, in the same way that a bee knows how to go and find honey, in the same way that, like I was saying, the cuckoos know where to go, that a weaver bird knows how to uh, weave its nests, uh, you know, all of those things, all of those instinctual behaviors that s countless animals have are all coded into the genetics. And so it's in the DNA of the spider to build the web. It's in the DNA of the brown recluse spider to make those beautiful egg sacs with uh, the little bubbles on them. 
It's in the DNA of the black widow spider to make an egg sac without the bobbles on them. And nobody's taught them to do that at all. They just know how to do that. And it is rather astounding that in that tiny little creature, there's the DNA contains sufficient information for them to create these amazing structures. Now, Jamie, I believe, is approaching either another den or she may even have an animal. I don't have an animal, I'm afraid, but I am off-road because I'm going back to an old den site that I was told about when I very first started working here, an old hyena den site that they used once briefly as a kind of a transition before they moved to Gallego Shortcut way back in 2015, at least for me, in terms of my history here. And I think it's just around the corner here. Now, if my guess is correct, and they're somewhere around Treehouse Dam, this is a possibility. Generally, hyenas will reuse old den sites. Right. Well, the good news is we're back on the, at the Philemon's Cutline Den, so I've obviously got the wrong place. Should we try that again? I'm not sure exactly where that old den is. I'm gonna have to search in the morning. It's too dark now for me to try and find an old road where the grasses are flattened. Now, Mary, you want to know if we've ever seen brown hyena before? I have seen lots of brown hyena, lots and lots of brown hyena, uh, but never here. I've never seen any in this area. I've even been fortunate enough to find brown hyena dens. And let me tell you, brown hyena cubs are just as cute as spotted hyenas, if not even more so. Uh, the places that I've worked in the past have, it, it, one place actually that was the dominant predator in the area that I was working in. So I've seen quite a few of them. They do occur here. Thought I saw a track, but it was a false alarm. They do occur here. It's unusual to see them in this part of the Sabi sand. They like to den in rocky outcrops and they are outcompeted by high numbers of spotted hyenas. So if there's lots of spotties, there's a chance. Let's go get that moonrise quickly. How quickly does the moon rise here in Africa? Let's go find out. Um, there is a, a, a chance they, they get outcompeted. However, one has been seen on the live drives with Peter Pretorius, I believe, many years ago. Haven't seen one since. Ah, oh, the moon has risen, everybody. Missed the moonrise, but that's okay. As Google says, it's up to us. I imagine that Google might say that about the moonrise too. And I think it's the proper full moon tonight. Let's get a dramatic dead tree in it as well. Oh, hold on. Bumping Craig all over the place. It's like a wild dog chase just for the moon. There we go. Quick before we miss out. We've got roughly somewhere between two and a half minutes and 15. Here we go. Full moon arising. That's awesome. Nice to just take a moment and sit and listen. of Franklin and Spurfowl as the evening falls. Cool. Here we 
we go. We got a bit of the moonrise. But now we've got to go and find some hyenas. I don't know where I'm going to go look for hyenas. Somewhere around Treehouse Dam, I guess. Let's see if they pop out. One other concern that I have, and that's I've seen almost every evening that I've come back late at the end of the sunset safari from Cheetah Plains or Chitwa, I've seen hyenas crossing south into Little Gowrie. But let's not, let's be positive first. They could still be right here. I really hope they are, and we don't have a repeat of last year's hyena, mass hyena disappearance. We're talking about brown hyenas. It's also a really fascinating creature, and something that I hope one day we're in a position that we can show you them on a more regular basis on our live safaris. You never know. It seems as though it's impossible to resist having a look at the moonrise. Let's go and see whether or not Tristan's looking at the same moon that we were. It is impossible not to look at the moon, especially where we are. We've got this sort of vista down along Gauri Main, and the moon is just cutting through those clouds and slowly rising up, and it is a very, very pretty sight indeed. So it's hard not to just stop and admire it rising ever so quickly. You can see how fast it actually moves. If you use the clouds as a sort of rate of it moving through, it's very, very quick indeed, and it's amazing how it gets smaller as it goes. Very, very cool. I was hoping that we were going to get a moonrise over Chitwa, but unfortunately we're a day too early. We'll need to go uh, tomorrow afternoon and we'll have a beautiful moonrise as the full moon comes over that dam. It's often very spectacular. I remember when I used to work at Chitwa and the times when I wasn't driving, I used to sit on the deck there and watch the moon coming over the, the dam. It was really, really spectacular. So it's a very, very pretty place to see the moon. But alas, today it just came up a little bit too late for it to get that sort of orange coloration and get enough light to actually see what's going on. But we are in the area of where Hosanna was this morning. But I did get a report from the south, from Little Gari side, is that there is tracks of Hosanna and Shongile together that side. So I think the both of them are there. And they were moving southwards towards Little Gauri um, to the lodge itself, which is, I would say, about a kilometer south of Gauri Main. So pretty much straight south along the Mulawati. And that's where they have the tracks and it's an area that they've been spending more and more time so I was just checking along in case you never know sometimes they do these big loops like we saw with Hosanna this morning his tracks went straight to Treehouse Dam from Treehouse Dam he turned around and came straight back this way again on top of his own tracks so it's worth just checking I also did get a report that somebody said they had tracks of a male leopard crossing into Vuyatella at around sort of 11 o'clock in the morning now I don't know who that could be because ultimately the tracks that I had on Weaver's Nest this morning, I asked them if it was those very same tracks and they said to me no it wasn't. So I'm going to just check along Weaver's Nest, maybe Tingana's creeped in here somewhere. I know we were talking about Tingana earlier, so maybe he's around somewhere. Ah, it's not a leopard but it is a creature of the night and one that Jamie has been looking for and we have a hyena isn't that awesome now I can't see exactly which one it is so all our hyena followers out there if you can let us know who this is hashtag safari live on Twitter but you most of you would already know that if you're following the hyenas now it is just coming across the bush and it's coming from that same area again it's coming from sort of Shibamu pans and they seem to use that road and then they come up Weaver's Nest, go towards Treehouse Dam. So I wonder if their den is not somewhere in this area. And you can see they're on their nightly patrol. And I'm pretty sure that this hyena is going to pick up the scent of that leopard from this morning and will be following along. There is a bit of a breeze blowing. So let's just see where it goes. Unfortunately, often with hyenas, it's just fleeting glimpses when they're moving like this at night because they move so quickly and they go through areas that are quite difficult for us to negotiate. As you can see on the right here, it's very, very thick. Hello, little one. Where are you off to? Now, it is heading exactly where Hosanna was this morning. So I wonder if it's not worth 
Just trying to see if we can't keep up with it a little bit and see if it takes us somewhere. I'm gonna try and just see. I want, obviously we're trying to find the den again because it seems like there's been very little action at the den itself. So I'm trying to see if maybe we can work out, but it's coming from the west, which is, Jamie and I were having a long discussion about it today as to where we think this den could be. Now, there should be a little gap in here somewhere where I can maybe just try and get in. And I still have the belief that it's somewhere around Treehouse Dam, maybe to the south of Treehouse Dam or north of Treehouse Dam. We weren't sure which one, but somewhere in that area. Now, where we had Osana, what's that in the road over there? That's an Impala. So I thought maybe it was something else. But let's see where our hyena goes. I wonder if it's going to pick up that scent of Hassan. Isn't this exciting? I always love following hyenas. They always seem like they're up to something. It's such a cool animal to follow. And this looks like a fairly young hyena. It's got very, very, very rounded ears. There's no tattiness on the ears at all. So it seems like a hyena that's fairly young. I haven't been able to establish if it is a male or female yet. They're very, very difficult to tell whether it's male or female. Uh, oh, hyena, why did you run into this? So this is exactly where we had Hosanna this morning. He walked from my left to my right here. But this hyena's run into a thicket that I don't think I'm going to be able to follow. Let's just try through here, Seb. That's exciting. Now, Kirst, you were asking me a question prior to our hyena, which I seem to have lost a sighting of. So if you want to... So, Lula from New Mexico, you want to know where the Incahumas and the sticks are. So, the Incahumas, as far as I know, there was tracks of them on Buffalo's Hook yesterday, but nobody found them. So, I think they're hanging around southern Manuleti at the moment, a little bit into Buffalo's Hook, and sometimes they're going into Simbambili as far as even Elephant Plains. Now, that's where they're kind of moving around. So, they are still around, and the last time I heard, there were still all five females and six cubs, so they were doing just fine. And it's very, very common for them not to be around this area at this time of the year. Often in summer, the Inkahumas shift up into Buffalo's Hook and Manuleti, where they go and hunt the buffalo herds that are up there. And as those buffalo herds then start pushing down in the winter months, well, after they've exhausted the resources up there, then the Inkahumas file back in and we start to see them on Juma again. Remember, we're not seeing very many buffalo at all and no herds of buffalo, which would have brought the Inkahumas is this way. Um, as for the sticks, the sticks were seen yesterday on Vessels. Now Vessels is a property to the south of us. It's probably about three kilometers south of us. I know one female was found this afternoon with a Birmingham male on Hoffmans, so that is a little bit west of Vessels, and it's between sort of Mala Mala and Juma, and they've been hanging around that area, and then also into a little bit into a nets where they've got the cubs. So that's where they really have been, a little bit south of sort of Chitwa Dam area, and have been hanging around there. But it's not to say that they won't come this way. It's now with those small cubs at the end of the day they have to spend time in a very localized area as once those cubs get a little bit bigger then we'll start to see them venturing further afield right i think we've lost our hyena it's gone into a really thick area that we're not going to be able to follow so while we kind of get ourselves out of this bush and thicket let's go back to james who's still playing with his microscope no, jamie might be an elephant whisperer but i everybody am a thrip whisperer i am the only thrip whisperer in all the world there we go. Now, I bet there are not many people that can say that they are the only something in the world. Well, I tell you that I am the only thrip whisperer in the world. There is a thrip. It is no more than one millimetre in length. It is less than a twentieth of... And... Uh, oh, hang on. It's less than a twentieth of an inch. But there is an aphid there that I believe it is probably going to try and catch. Either this thrip is a nectar drinker or it is a tender of aphids, in other words it'll get, take the honeysuckle from them, or it is a predator of aphids. Now while we wait and see how this <gasps> action unfolds, did you see the, did you see, can you see that? That is amazing, let me zoom in, there's an aphid right there. And to lose focus for a little while, but don't worry about it everybody, it'll be retained shortly, and you will miss none of the action going on here. Ooh. Beautiful. Not so beautiful. Hang on. There we go. That's a better picture. And there you can see the little thing to the right-hand side, the little yellow thing there. That's an aphid of some sort. And that thrip is probably gone to sleep, actually. Now, what's interesting is that these things are 
there are two interesting things about them. Firstly, they are known as agricultural pests, so they can get into agricultural crops and transmit viruses. They're apparently vectors of a number of viruses to plants. But also, they are able to reproduce by a process known as parthenogenesis. Now, parthenogenesis is when a female produces an offspring from an unfertilized egg. And it is not a clone, as far as I understand it. What happens is that the genetics in two eggs combine to create a viable, normally female offspring. There she comes. I mean, that might be a he. But she's going to walk out of frame now, I'm afraid. Now, Lorena, you say you will never forget thrips. I'm so glad you will never forget thrips. I will probably never forget them either. Well, I won't, of course. I'm the only uh, thrip whisperer in the world. But you can actually see it there. You can just see it. You see the little black thing there, Ferg? It is so tiny. Let's just keep looking. There. That little black line on the top of this plant is the thrip. What a magnificent thrip. The black thrip of Waltheria. I'm going to try and find another thrip. Yes, that's what I said. Another thrip. While I do that, let us go across to the Elephant Whisperer, of which there must be more than one. There must be several, I imagine, but uh, for now, you are across with me. <laughs> I think James is, I don't know, I would have, I would have called him, I don't know if I would have gone to the flip, 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 <laughs> I can't even say the word, Whisperer. It's because that tent is teeming with things. By the way, James is telling you the terrifying tale of the brown button spider in the tent. There were three of them in Wendy this morning. I went through to just grab my stuff out so that Taylor could get in. I did warn Taylor to watch out for them. I was out on bushwalk this morning, but there were three button, brown button spiders in Wendy. As to where they went, Nobody knows. I have absolutely no idea. Now, Vern, you're wondering about how Taylor's doing. She's absolutely fine. I, we, she was determined for some silly reason that she was going to come out this afternoon. Uh, that's how dedicated she is and how much she loves being out here. Uh, but we, we basically tied her down for the afternoon. So she is better than she was this morning. She was feeling a little bit dizzy and a little bit unwell. And we put her straight to bed and she's been um, forced into bed rest by an entire camp of caring people. And every time she comes out, we sort of point threatening her, threateningly in her direction and send her back to bed. So she'll be absolutely fine, I'm sure, but I will pass on your well wishes. Thank you so much to all of you that have sent them through. I know they mean a great deal to her and I'm sure she'll thank you herself once she's up and running. She'll be fine, I'm sure. There was a passing thought that I had in my mind before I realized she would have felt it. She would have felt the bite. But I did actually, I was a little bit concerned maybe it was the button spiders that had bitten her this morning. Or one of the button spiders. But they're so, they are such relaxed spiders and it, it, they don't bite very easily. And she would have felt, because it's neurotoxic, she would have felt the bite immediately if it had happened. And it was just a passing thought when I first heard that she wasn't feeling very well. Taylor will be fine. She's tough. She'll be back up and running in no time at all. Okay, no hyenas. I'm glad Tristan managed to find you a hyena, even if I didn't. I haven't seen a single track on Philemon's cut line either. I'm... just hopped into the grass. What on earth are you still doing out? There it is over there, Craig. Oh, let me go forward a bit. 
Yo, frog. That was very nearly the end of you. Can you see it there? Oh, uh, whoops. There he goes. Phew. My goodness, that was close. That hopped straight into and underneath my windows. My windows? My wheels, not my windows. That doesn't make any sense. Phew. Phew. That was very, very close. All this late rain and warm temperatures that we've been having has kept the frogs around for longer, the chameleons, the grass seeds. All right, I'm still recovering from the fright I got. I have a very, very good record in terms of the only creature I've ever hit was a nightjar, and that was on a dirt road. And it happened very quickly. I was on a dirt road outside of a reserve and I just couldn't stop. So I was very scared I'd just squidged a frog. But I hadn't. It's alive and well. Heart beating as fast as mine, I imagine. Speaking of birds in the road, Tristan's found one. Well, we also almost squished a frog, Jamie. We also had to do a dodging maneuver and then it bounced off into the bush. So we didn't get to show you. It was a little dwarf puddle frog. But what we have here is a bronze wing corsa. And these are our nocturnal birds that we've seen so many of over the summer months. It's been amazing actually to see them. Generally, they're quite a shy bird. And I spent quite a few years in the Sabi Sands. And they're a bird that was quite difficult to actually find in certain areas. But this year, they have literally been everywhere. Every road that you drive, you find them. Brent and I were talking about it before he left to Kenya. And we were just saying that at some nights you can drive and see 30, 40 of them just on your way home. So it's been amazing to actually spend so much time with them. And they are very pretty birds with that sort of black and white mask that they have. And that red eye ring and those red legs. And you can see it's just running down the road away from us at the moment. Well, we're not trying to scare you. I'm sorry. Maybe we should turn off our lights and let it disappear into the darkness. What do you think, Seb? I think that's a good idea. There we go. So, we still haven't come up with anything in terms of the spotted cats. It um, seems like those two are still south of us and no sign of Tingana where the guy said that he had crossed. I'm sure those are the tracks we followed this morning. Right, we're going to slowly start making our way home. It's that time of the day. So let's head back to James Hendry, who's still gazing upon the moon and I wonder if he's got a little song or a lullaby to lull us all into the night. And the moon hits your eyes like a great pizza pie that summer I don't know the rest of the words, I'm afraid, and I apologise for that. I wasn't going to do that. It's Tristan's fault entirely. Now, we have a question coming through about whether or not... I am more uh, James-like when the moon is out. That is all the way from London, Monique. Uh, I haven't I've heard briefly from you over the... I think it was about two days ago and for the first time, and now you ask me a question like that. Um, well, I... I yeah, perhaps... I feel that I have been uh, slightly more, uh, perhaps, eccentric during the course of this last little uh, three hours or so. I'm just trying to find some lighting for myself. How's that? Does that look nice? Better without. Better without. That's better. Is that better? Okay, good. You don't like that? Is that not good? I, I, I quite like it. If you've got a ghost story to tell, that'd be a good one. How about that? <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> let's get back inside quickly. Uh, we've got something under the microscope, but I, ho I was hoping it was going to show the final thrip. But it isn't. This is the knotweed, and the second species of thrip that I found was on a knotweed. And unfortunately, there my thrip whispering skills have let me down horribly. Let's just have a quick scan. There, no, no, alas, not. All right, everybody, that is going to be it from us for the, for the day. 
Thank you for coming into the tent and talking to us. I've had a wonderful time today. Thank you, Fergus, for your efforts today. And, of course, a big thanks to the final control, filled with delightful ladies who are so kind to us. But mostly, all of you, for coming on Drive With Us. Remember, tomorrow, a big rehearsal. So come along for that.